welcome back to uh, part two of the of the podcast. Thanks for coming again. My pleasure. How was the drive down this time round, mate? A little bit. Uh, yeah, good, good. The sun's at my back, and it's a very pleasant mm. drive. No rain, no fog. No, yeah. yeah mm. a little bit. I really appreciate you coming, and I'd like to apologise to the people from last time because I. Uh, we couldn't film the podcast. Now, the reason we couldn't film it is I found out I'm pretty disorganised and I, I lost these little SD cards for the cameras. So um, a few lessons, mate. I need to get more organised. <laughs> and the second point is I need to have a lot more SD cards. So, it's, Well, seeing they're so small, it's probably a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, mate, we, ke- we kept people hanging. Um, we, we went through... Um, your how you got into running a bit of your earlier life your training your, the big lead up and then we started in brisbane we went all the way to Tennant creek and um mum and dad came in with some scones i could see they were waiting outside oh yeah and were they good eh? i mean what 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 better farm fresh farm <sighs> scones eh? gee where's well you don't want to keep mum waiting you don't want to keep her no, waiting out right, there with hot yeah, scones. Yeah, yeah, and they were, yeah, jam, lots of jam <laughs> and cream. It was very nice. So we left people <laughs> hanging in, um, in Tennant Creek, mate. But um, I think I'm going to – there's a really good quote in, in, these, in these later chapters here, which um, I'll, I'll try to find. I did take a, a picture on my phone. The 10 two-letter word. A ten two letter word. <laughs> Is that it? Um, no. Well, actually, what I want to talk about before we take off again from Tennant Creek is you had some some mission statements in your caravan, or you had some inspirational quotes um, from some people that it was a bit like a bit of a mantra. That kept you going. Maybe I'll have to have a look back at. Yeah, I, I I don't recall the others, but I I dare say there were. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that I probably would forget at the moment. Um, but but you know, I used to have in my head some quotes from the Bible too. You know, I mean, things like uh, you, you'll run and and not get weary. You'll you'll walk and not faint. Uh, yeah. I mean, wonderful quotes I'd have like that to to use at the appropriate times. And, and then I came across a, a quote in a Reader's Digest. Someone picked up some old Reader's Digest and I, I wasn't reading much on this trip, of course, and I just opened it up and there, you know, in the Reader's Digest, they have little quotes along the bottom. And here was ten two, two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to me. That's it. Well, we, That's I got, I got the, someone to pin that up where I could see it all the time because, you know, no matter what you believe your uh, goal is, you've still got to remember it's only you that's going to do it, nobody mm, else. Mm. You've got to take every step. And, and just seeing that was, was rather appropriate at the time because that was after Tennant Creek too, by the way, further on we jumped a bit ahead. But uh, right at the time when I really needed it, if it is to be, it is up to me. In, in that case, here I am running around Australia, I couldn't let the crew do it because it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> so, mate, I just... I was just on my phone, sorry. So it's 272. Um, this isn't actually one of those, one of those inspirational quotes, but um, I really like this um, little couple of paragraphs here, so I'm just going to read it out. People have asked me, uh, people have asked me, how do I keep going on a down like I, like I am in right now? I guess I'd better tell myself, what I said because I sure need to remember. To start off, I accepted the fact before I left home that I was going around Australia running every day continuously. Once I accepted that, everything else is a lot easier. It's no use me thinking I will make it if I don't get too depressed, if I don't get sick, if I have an injury or if and if and if. When I get down, I have to talk myself into uh, staying on the road. But as I say, once I had accepted totally my commitment to the road to keep going, to stay there and to not get off it, I was a long way. I was a long way there. The biggest part of my problem was solved 
before I left home. Positive thinking all the way. I remember when training for the run, I used to think of running around Australia. I used to think of going through Perth, Melbourne and Sydney. I used to think of myself being down and out and depressed, sore and aching. So on the actual run, when some days I am not sore and aching, I feel great. Then on some days when I am depressed, down and out, I'm half expecting it anyway. So it's not a shock. I have no magic way of changing that when I wake up as I did today thinking, oh no, how can I stand it? I have no magic way of clicking my fingers and changing it. I just have to hang in there for the day. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I read that. It's about half a page, but I think it's really important um, that little half a page just to understand your mindset. Yes. And that was... That was a solid commitment before you even started the run. It has to be, Timothy. You've you've got to make that decision. And and that decision gets made some months before because you don't want to waste everyone's time leading up to the event either to decide at the last minute. So you make the decision. You look at the negatives and you decide, yes, we can overcome them or we'll do our best to overcome them. And then you look at the positives, which have got to outweigh the negatives, of course, and then all that, and there's no good saying, well, if it doesn't get too hot or if it doesn't get too cold or, or if I don't get injured, because you're going to get injured. You're going to have problems, which I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have all the bad weathers. There's not really anything that we didn't have at some point. So you've got to make that decision. You're going to do it no matter what. And there's no point in fooling yourself and thinking. I was talking to a bloke the other day, a young fellow, early 20s. He's going to run the uh, Gold Coast Marathon. And I said, oh, how much are you doing? Oh, I did a few weeks training and I missed the last month. But, um, I mean, oh, goodness me, I thought straight away, he's not committed. He's in for a terrible time <laughs> and he's going to get a big shock. You've got to really be dedicated to it. You've got to, And I wouldn't miss a day's training too, by the way. Once I decided I was going to do it, and, and, and I hardly ever missed a day's training in, 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 four, in 30 years of running. But once I decide to do something like this for five good months before, Every day, you just go out no matter what. I can recall one day in training and um, I, I knew this day was going to be busy all day because of my business, things were happening and I think I had a, a, a talk at a school or something. I thought, goodness me, in daylight hours, I'm busy, really busy. So I set the alarm for two o'clock in the morning to go training before I started the day. And that's bad enough going out in the dark. I'm not excited about that. And then I woke up and here I, I could hear the rain on the roof. I thought, oh, no, it's dark, it's wet. Maybe one day won't matter. But then I thought, nope, I decided I was not going to miss a day leading up to the event. This is all part of the um, being positive about everything. So I got up and I went out and run 20 miles or something like that before I started the day or 20K or whatever it was at the time. So, you know, these sort of things – set you up for not failing because you know you're going to have a tough out there. There's no point in fooling yourself and thinking, oh, maybe this won't be bad because mm. it is bad. Yeah, mate, I, I, yeah, it, it's a real insight into your mindset. And, um, you know, if you only ran, if you only went for a run when you were motivated and you felt like it, well, no <laughs> one would actually run, would they? You'd hardly train. You'd hardly train. And exactly. I think it's not just running. I think it's anything in life. If, That's it. If you, um, I think if you, if you commit to anything, you might as well go for it and, and yes. be your best at it. That's right. And That's you're not right. going to get far no. if you say, well, you know, I don't really feel like doing the bread run today. I, yeah, you know, I might look. I think yeah. tomorrow. Tomorrow is always. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. But yeah, um, yeah. tomorrow is not a day, is it? That's right. That's, <laughs> that's it. That's it. It goes on and on. It, you miss one day. It's so easy to miss two. Then, you know, the great Ron Clark used to say, "Oh, yeah, I could miss one day, and I, I no one might notice, but I miss two days, and I'll notice, and I miss three days, and my opponents will notice it, and on it goes. It just gets worse. So yep. you don't miss. That was that's from the Ron, Ron Clark who who didn't want to run long distance. Well, he well he did five and ten k's and that, but mm. he could have missed a day quite easily here and there. But he just didn't. He just yep. went out and did the work. Yeah, and and would you agree, Ron, that it's those <laughs> days when you don't feel like running 
that are most important. That's what builds your character oh, and mental strength. Definitely. And I used to love bad. If I was uh, going in an ultra race somewhere or an ordinary race somewhere and, and the weather was bad and was cyclonic, uh, too hot or something, I'd still go out and train thinking, ah, maybe my opponents are not training today. Maybe they're having the day off. And, and so for me, it was psychologically beneficial to be out there doing it in the yeah. bad weather. So that, that was your... That was your real competitive edge, that you'd get out there in all yes. sorts of conditions. And as we talked about last week, you never had a day off. So even in training, you, you mm. went out every day. Yes, yes, right. definitely. Once I decided I was doing an event, and I usually picked about five months of, of really upping my training to bigger miles and, and, and making sure I never missed as part of the psychological thing in the preparation. Yeah, yeah, that's, that was the plan. Dead Cow Gully is one of the most talked about events on the running calendar. 6.7 k's each hour, every hour, until the last one is standing. We're located on a 1600 acre working cattle property and we've called this place home for about 150 years. We would love for you to come out and check out the action. But last year, we sold all the tickets in about 14 hours, so you need to get in quick to secure your spot. Tickets will go on sale this year at 6 p.m. September 25. Lock in this date, 6 p.m. September 25. You can register through our website, deadcowgully.com.au, or on our Facebook or Instagram page. Thank you. Right here, Ron. So we're in Tennant Creek, and um, as we talked about in part one, the Barclay seemed to be the biggest test. Now, when we talk about a mental low, you know, or a mental or mental physical low, um, you know, if someone does an ordinary 100-mile race, this could be for a few hours, and you just have to pass through it. But your mental lows weren't just a few hours or a few days. Often mm. it seems your mental lows were actually for weeks, for weeks. And, and you think, well, God, how do you, how do you actually uh, get out of the van? Because um, the caravan, whenever you're in the caravan, you're resting, right? And just mm. to open that door up the next day, when you're having a low, there must be a feeling of dread, to actually get out there and face that road? Very much so. You know, for the most part in Australia in, back in the 80s, there, there, it wasn't very populated to start with. There wasn't a lot of people passing by in cars. There was a lot of isolation and a white line down the middle of the road for the most part. And um, I don't know, I don't, if anyone says they just love running all day, I, I don't understand it. I... <laughs> It's a, it's a hard way to go and, and um, I'd sometimes be so sore I'd have to sit on the top seat of the caravan and put my feet on the next one and the next one and get out and then start walking slowly for a bit and loosen up and I'd, you know, I'd come good, of course, mm. but it was hard work. And some days I'd be thinking, oh, how can I handle this? I remember the odd occasion when I'd actually have tears rolling down my face thinking, oh, I don't want to do this, I can't do this. Yeah. But, but you do because you said you would. About as simple as that. Yeah. And that's what people don't see, right? They don't see you when you first start your run and it's that feeling of dread. And as you said, and you've talked about this before um, to me privately, you actually had tears rolling down your your cheek. So, uh, you know, this is not for the faint-hearted. This is not rainbows and sunshine. Oh, no, no. And you have the glory when you pass into these towns and when you eventually finish the run, but uh, it's – it's those days when you're just that hard, hard slog where it's just, it seems every day is just a battle against yourself. Well, that's right, that's right. Once the crew came along after about 20K and you'd have a bit of solid breakfast, I'd have a little bit before I left early, but uh, solid breakfast, and uh, after that I'd break it up into 5K sections for most part and, and, and make sh- kept it all short, looking forward to the next 5K finish where I'd see the crew again and and hear what they've heard on the radio or, or talk to somebody. or, um, or, or And maybe I'd, I'd sit on the chair for 
for half a minute or a minute or two or whatever, mm. five minutes if I really felt awful, just having a chat, you know, mm. um, just to change it, you know, just to get down and get up and, and do something different. Not every time I would, would um, sit down, not, not every time. Sometimes just have a big drink of water and keep going. Mm. But you break it down into short pieces all day, get to lunch, have some lunch, have a little nap, get up and go again and then look forward to tea time and bet going to bed. Yeah. So, but you, you couldn't think ahead. If you thought ahead much, it was a terrible situation. It, it just really would get you, get you, yeah. Yeah. But when you say thinking ahead, are you talking about how far have I actually got to go? How, oh, well, how many more days on the road have I got? Oh, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, somewhere up around Darwin, I don't recall it was just coming into, leaving Darwin or somewhere up in that area – was so was the first of June. Um, I'd have to look in the book to get the dates exactly right, but it doesn't matter. So so was the first of June, and, and and I said to my crew, "When do I arrive in Perth?" And they came back and said, "Oh, third or fourth of August." Well, that really got me. I thought, "What? This is June. I don't get there in July. It's not till August. Do I get to Perth?" And I said, "Look, can you do some sums?" reworking the schedule and, and get me there next month. And they came back and, yep, okay, we can get you there on the 31st of July or something like that. And straight away that fixed me up for the sure. – I could handle it. Now, that's how low you get. I mean, that is silly, isn't it, really, in, in, in sensible thinking. That is foolish. But when you're in that physical, uh, worn-out state, mentally and physically, um, that little thing makes a difference. Oh, this is June. Next month I'm in Perth. Oh, I can handle that. Yeah. So, Ron, can you feel a mental load coming on? Can you, um, before it happens, and you don't know how long it's going to last, you, it, could be, it could be hours, could be days, or could be weeks, can you, are the little signs that negativity is creeping in, can you, can you say to your crew, oh, look, I think, I think I can feel something coming on here? Uh, or does it just does it just happen? Do you uh, just slowly slide uh, into it? It just slowly happens. You know, I, I'm not a depressed sort of person at all or anything like that, but that was just a bit too much, you know. I mean, you just think, oh, I'd like to read a good book or go to see a movie or sit in a milk bar and watch people, <laughs> something nice and pleasant. So yeah. it, it'd come on slowly and you just uh, deal with it for most part and the crew would know, they'd soon pick yeah. up on it. Yeah. yeah. And do you um, – while you were in these lows, did you actually talk to the crew about it? Did you vocalise how you were feeling or were you just mainly having a conversation with yourself? Uh, pretty much mainly myself, I would say, but they'd soon see it. You know, they'd tell. They'd be able to tell. Um, but, you know, when, you, when you're just thinking everything's the same, it's the same sameness, someone would pull up and uh, you'd have a chat, you'd stop and have a talk with them and it'd just change your whole outlook. Yep. Just because some people are just that way, you know, just sure. talking to some people cheer you up. Sure, yeah. Okay, mate, so you got through the Barclay and it's this huge uh, relief. Cause do you think when you hit – sorry, when you hit Tennant Creek and three ways, is that when you came out of this mental low? Oh, that made a big difference because the Barclay was really bad when I went across. It was in drought, uh, flies, unbelievable flies that cover a white shirt, you know, and, 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 and it was just uh, – you, you couldn't – you, you couldn't even open your mouth to have water without flies. They're up your nose, they're everywhere, and so therefore the fly net. And uh, getting there was was certainly a big difference. And, and there were people waiting there at the three ways, come from Tennant Creek and all. And there was this fella, Bob Burton, a Rotarian from Tennant Creek, and he owned several businesses, including a milk bar. Well, he said, come on. We didn't have to go down to Tennant Creek. We are going north to Catherine. I think that's the way it worked. That's yeah, Tennant right. Creek was just south. And uh, he said, but come on in, follow me in, or you and the crew. I'm shouting you all to milkshakes and lunch and everything. And things like that are worth it. You know, you make sure you get your t distance up for the day and, and go and do that regardless of the time you might think, oh, I need. But I'm not trying to break someone's record. I'm trying to be the first to do this see? that's right so so i've got the time to to, to go there and that, that's marvelous and he was great bob burton in fact he, he he followed us up the highway and stopped to see us on several occasions and shouted us more milkshakes at other milk bars 
Um, so we, we claimed we were doing a test of milkshakes around the country after that. And, see, <laughs> and, and none of them beat Bob Burton's milkshakes. They were icy cold. He told us the secret of making them and what have you. And, yeah, things like that were really, really something. And the whole town t- comes out to see you. And, and country towns, they, that cheers you up, you know. You, exactly. It's very nice. Yeah, because there's these little acts of generosity along the whole way. So it's either people are giving you free food or they don't accept payment for accommodation maybe. Oh, yes, so or, much. Um, they say, hey, do you want to come into my house and use the showers and toilets? Yes, yes. So, so it seems like every day Australians were opening up sure. their homes and, and, and their wallets in some sense to you and and um, – if there's mechanical trouble or this or this or this or needed something fixed, often people, it seems, um, they didn't accept payment and it was their way of of saying, good on you, Ron, keep going. Oh, yes. You didn't get the major sponsorship to help you, the big, the big financial sponsor, which we talked about before, is just it beggars belief. Mm-hmm. But it seems like everyday ordinary Australians were trying to lift you up. Yes, Oh, all the way. It was marvellous, except there's great big gaps where there's where there were no people back then, of course, and 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 um, yeah, very few people. You know, even even the big uh, the trucks would would toss out the papers to us or stop and give us the papers and mm-hmm. and uh, uh, hear that we maybe we needed certain supplies. Um, the milk companies across uh, the top from the tablelands across to uh, Northern yeah. Territory, Melanda or someone it Melanda, was. Melanda, yeah. Back in those days. They they heard that I loved yogurt. Well, we got fresh every few days. We had the Melanda milk truck stop and give us milk and yogurt. Incredible. And all sorts of things. And yeah. that was for free? That was oh, f- totally free, yeah. Wow. Oh, and the trucks, the, the, talk about truck drivers, they'd, they'd pull over onto the other side of the road to get out of your way. It was, wasn't me getting out of their way for most part. It was them getting mm. out of my way, and and they'd tell each other what was happening, and it was like the whole West. Yeah, so so the the truck drivers were like your little lifeline. Oh out yeah. There. yeah, 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 yeah. They'd let the crew know anything ahead, and I watch found out it astounding, mate. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but um, this milk run from Atherton. <laughs> Um, all the way to Darwin. Do they still have this? I don't know. I don't know because much, most everything's changed. I mean, back in those days we had a, a dairy – all the little towns had their own milk butter factories and milk factories and all that, and they're not there now, so who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Probably bought out by one of the big fellas. Yeah. Which you would – I bet they wouldn't stop and give you yogurt <laughs> and milk. <laughs> probably not, mate. <laughs> Rightio, so you get to Tennant Creek and you have these um, um, like probably a rotary um, reception. Did you find these social engagements um, taxing in some sense? I know you want – I know you you drew energy <laughs> off seeing people, but in terms of the whole public appearance and making <laughs> a speech, did that um, – were you kind of thinking in the back of your mind, God, I just want to get back to the caravan and, and lie down and have a sleep? Um, well, yes, a, b- a bit of both. You know, they are draining, but at the same time, when you've been a long time w- with nothing, like the Barclay Highway and all that, it was good and fun. But, yes, after it's over, you think, oh, gee, I just need a bit of quiet now too because, um, y- 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 you know, people think, oh, running's boring. Well, to a point, yes, you- you- you're running, 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 but you also got to think – all the time, you are thinking. You're trying to make sure you're eating enough, drinking enough, um, not tripping, not not rolling an ankle on the edge of the bitumen, etc., etc. So you need your thoughts about you to to accomplish your task because you can't take a day off. You can't have an accident. You can't get sick. Um, you've got to make sure you avoid all these things. So all these things were taxing, and and then you had to get back to that. So there was really no break from anything. But it was still good to go and do it. Very, very good to go and do it. And I appreciated it a real lot. And most interesting people. We'd met property owners and all sorts of people, business owners had come to say hello. And it was great. But it was draining. And, and I was well aware that I had to kind of uh, speak to them and mm. be friendly because you sort of owe it to people because they're yeah. putting themselves out for you. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so you um, – and then you, you go from Tennant Creek and you make your way up to Catherine, which is a beautiful location. You've got the Catherine Gorge up there, which is yes. quite famous. And it, it, it seems that you did 
get a boat ride? Or was uh, it on the way back? On or? the way back, I'm pretty sure okay. it was. We got to Darwin. We wanted to get to Darwin. Um, and, and, and yes, on the way back, I'm pretty sure. And and uh, we totally free, the crew and myself and all, got a, a, a free ride up the gorge. Terrific. Magnificent. Yeah. It's oh, beautiful. It's oh, stunning, isn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. So did you get a big reception in Darwin? Because that was really your yes. biggest, your biggest um, reception, probably since – what, Brisbane or Mount Isa? Mount Isa was marvellous. I think yep. I mentioned there that one of the kids running into Mount Isa with me turned out to be later in many many years later my daughter-in-law. Yeah, wow. Um, and that was great. Mount Isa was terrific. Um, Darwin was marvellous, really, because it's a pretty big place and you don't expect it. But, oh, the streets were lined with school children and there's mm. people everywhere. And the, mm. the, um, the government up there came... Heads of the government came out to, to greet me, or or, or met, met us at the middle of the town, or wherever it was, whether it was the post office or Parliament House or somewhere. Yeah, Tur- it, turned out the uh, administrator at the time up there, a uh, fellow named Paul Everingham, became my solicitor in Caboolture soon after <laughs> that when he retired from being admin- administrator as like premier, yeah. premier of the Northern Territory. And he's been my solicitor for ever since then. So he, was he the Premier of Northern Territory? Northern Territory? Administrator, they called him, Paul Everingham. Wow. And there's a yeah. cartoon came out in the paper of me running and him riding a push bike, sweating. And uh, it was a beauty. I reminded him, I showed him years later. Yeah. I said, you ever see this, Paul? He said, I'm trying to forget about it. He said, <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. to- I think that was in the book too, that photo. Uh, I think so, yeah. yes, yes. Or that that. It was a drawer and cartoon, wasn't it? Was it something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cartoon, cartoon. That's right. It was. Yeah. It was. It was a cartoon. Yeah, you've got it. Yeah. So you seem to be quite taken with Darwin through reading the book. I'm not sure you didn't really know what to expect, but you seem to think the people had some kind of spirit. And because Cyclone Tracy wouldn't have been that long ago, because 1983. When was Cyclone Tracy? Was that 1970? In the 70s, 74, I think it was. 74? Is that around the time Brisbane was flooded as well? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Was that the same year, the big Brisbane floods and was Cyclone Tracy? could have been. I, oh, look, it's a long, look, long time ago. I'll have to look it up, but I reckon <laughs> yeah. it, Cyclone Tracy, 74, sounds, sounds familiar. So I guess um, nine years later, you come running in. Did you see any signs of the of – not that I remember. Yeah, okay, they would have cleaned not, everything up. Not that I remembered, but but yes, I think they were pretty good at it. They got Clem Jones up there, didn't they, to mm. take over and all, get things organised. Yeah, right. And uh, apparently did a good job. Yeah. So so maybe that was the case. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So then you, um, <laughs> it would have been strange because you got to go up from uh, from Catherine to Dar- to Darwin and, and then back. back to Catherine <laughs> and back again. So, so that would have been yeah. interesting. And then when you're on your way back. You um you see the gorge yes and then um eventually you then look uh, you look westwards and you yes. think yes here here we come Kimberley yes here we come here we come but as I said before you know looking forward to oh, only next month I'll be in Perth so you know oh, that was pretty good mentally heading off and it was pretty nice across there too really you know the countryside wasn't anything like the Barclay Highway it was mm. rather quite good mm. and um yeah what did we come to Tin- tenon creek i think that's where they picked up the reader's digest and i got that quote and that was a little bit of something for mm-hmm. quite a quite a little miracle to open it up and see that in front of you and mm. and um and then kananara was um most interesting little place and 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 talk about you know darwin hundreds of people government i mean kananara it was great too <laughs> this this businessman who was a runner picked told us to follow him and we went into his laundromat and we sat on the floor having a feed and a drink and in, in his laundromat so there are the two differences but but it was good it, mm. was, it was so nice you know just yeah Kananara because you would have did you get a chance to look at the um the Ord River scheme the big um I, I did see some water but I didn't I was starting to get pretty you know weary in all ways yeah, and yeah. and i didn't i didn't go sightseeing like anyone yep. would tripping around not a yep. lot no but i did see a lot of water and yep. what have you but yep. i don't recall a, a real lot about it except that sure. it was rugged and 
very nice and very, yeah, it would be good to go back mm-hmm. and have a proper look one day. So what are your memories of the Kimberley, mate? Because it, it seems that you were quite um, – you were pretty excited to get up there because I guess people, a lot of people hear about the Kimberley and there's a lot of romance surrounding the Kimberley with the big cattle stations and the scenery. Oh, the Duracs went there, see? Yeah. And I was a great fan. of. I've always read about early explorers, early pioneers and all, and, and the Duracs come 1,000 miles from down south up to open up the southwest of Queensland, cattle properties, you know, Kings and Grass Castles was written about them and... So the, the original Duracs were unbelievable, and then the Suns went and opened up northwest Western Australia, and 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 so that they kind of made the Kimberleys very well known from, you know, and then a lot of other cattlemen moved in as well. So mm. it was very big stuff. And the dad who opened up the Western Western Queensland area, he went up there in his older age, but he found it hard to handle, you know, just the heat and everything mm-hmm. as he was older. But, yeah, most interesting. And it, it seems like it was still, it was pretty damn hot up there, um, oh. 30 plus. And um, you, were, you were sort of, um, um, you're, trying to, you're trying to cool off and it seems that you, you came across a few water holes on the way. I think your crew would probably find them when they're, jump, they're leapfrogging oh, ahead of you. and you go and jump in dirty old dams or uh, sit under balls, a few balls up there and yeah, sit under them and let the balls run over, over you and that. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, all the while you're doing this, Ron, it seems you've got a stress fracture um, in your foot or your toe. My f- foot. One foot become extremely sore. We didn't know what it was. Um, one of my crew members was... Um, into that sort of thing, and he was pretty sure it was, although way later on a fella came out and said, oh, I don't know if it is, so we're not sure. Um, but they wanted me to go and get attention, but I wouldn't go because, again, everything's very – it's a very mental thing, this whole thing. And and if someone tells you you've got something, which is a bad name, like a stress fax is not a good thing to have if you're trying to run around Australia – I say, you don't want to know that. While you don't know, you just think, oh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe I'm just being sucky about it or something. So I wouldn't go to any medical person to, to find out, um, which they were disappointed, but I didn't. Uh, and, and so what I had to do, it was so sore, my foot, I, I had to slice the inside of the shoe. It was the inside of the foot. I think it was the left foot. And um, where, where the foot touched the shoe, I couldn't handle the pressure of that. So I'd slice the shoe and that helped. It was all right while I was on the bitumen, but when I had to get off the bitumen, back in those days there was no white line with a nice edge on it. It was into the stones and stuff. That really hurt it. But, but you know, yeah, it never got any worse. Yeah. So so you this happened actually fairly early on. I reckon this would have started to um, appear in Queensland? Well, probably, yes. Yes, probably did. But little things you don't take a lot of notice yeah. because you're always going to have a little ache or pain. Yeah. I always said if something's hurt and don't worry about it because tomorrow it'll be something else. <laughs> and your crew, your crew knew about this um, issue with your foot? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, and, and they were quite concerned. And yes, I think yes. There was a battle between really, I think one of your crew um, – I'm not sure what his name is, but he, he wanted you to actually get this looked at and get um get Oh, yes, Lee, Lee, Lee Tickle, very good runner, Lee. very good runner, and um, is better than I was over short distance. I could never beat him either. <laughs> and and he, he was um, – he, he knew – he knew quite a lot of medical people and he understood a lot of those sort of things, which is fair enough. He's probably right about it all. Too. But, yeah, I, I just objected. And, yeah. Because as soon as you find this out, this is a this is an excuse to um, to stop the run. You've almost you've you can justify stopping instead of saying, "Oh yes," instead of saying, "I'm stopping because oh. I've just had a gut full of this whole damn thing." Yes. You can say, "Well, I'm actually stopping because of this injury." And oh yes, I wouldn't want to put oh. my I wouldn't want to put my health at risk. Well, people do it all the time. Okay. I, medically, I've been told the doctor said this, so I can't. Yeah, I, I, I used to organise a lot of running races, as you do, Timothy. And um, I remember one event I, I, I was organising a thousand mile right here in the Nango. It was, and one of the blokes that was in it, who, who was doing quite well, suddenly got a sore ankle, or sore calf, or something, 
and he's pretty well off, good bloke. Um, and and he, he, he phoned his doctor and the doctor said, oh, I'll come out. I said, Ian, don't let him come. You'll be out of the race if you let him come. Well, he did come and he is out of the race. Yeah. Yeah. Not saying the doctor was wrong, not saying Ian was wrong. It's just what happens. Mm. It's how you think. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and yeah, and you knew this, you knew this very well that as soon as you found out that if you had a stress fracture um, during a mental low, this is very, very dangerous information. Oh, to have. very, very uh, <laughs> great reason. No one can condemn you for pulling out. Oh, I had to. The doctor said so. Yep. Yep. Okay, mate, so um, you, you went through Kununurra and you're, you're getting a real um, this sort of outback spirit and frontier spirit and you're heading to Halls Creek and you know there's a, there's a patch of dirt road coming up. I believe, is it from Halls Creek to Fitzroy Crossing? That's right, yes. Yep. Yep. So that was the only part only of the Only part trip. left, yeah. So it must have been a few, a few hundred k's. Of, Not sure now. Dirt road. I'll have to look it didn't, up. Didn't seem far. A few days. That was all. Yeah. <laughs> was this concerning to you, mate? Did you know? Did you know the the um, condition of this dirt road? I had no idea what it was like, and I don't recall it being too bad. So maybe it wasn't too bad. I I don't recall it, but uh, I'm I'm pleased to have encountered some dirt road actually, because it's sort of the old days, isn't it? Even though yeah. it wasn't much, you know. Yeah. And, I guess you just get a whole lot of dust in your face. Yeah, when yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, you made sure you got on the right side of the road if there was a breeze blowing and a vehicle went past. You know, you didn't stay on that side and take a mouthful of dust. You'd, you'd get over and get away from it. Yeah. But you could, see, there's hardly any traffic. You could run down the middle of the road for the most part. Mm. But after that, somewhere after that, the roads were the best in Australia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I used to live up in the Kimberley and – um, WA, there's some great roads over there now. Oh, fantastic I bet. roads! I bet. So you mm. get to Fitzroy Crossing, and yeah, Fitzroy's great because you're on the um, you're on the Fitzroy River, and you stopped off at the pub there, and it, it's a real oasis up there mm. in Fitzroy Crossing. I'm not sure if this is the same pub that when when I was up there, but it's just it's right on the Fitzroy. It almost looks like a golf course. There's a big caravan park up there. It's lovely and green. There'd be probably It'd probably be twenty or thirty acres of right. just this lovely um, green. Um, it almost looks like a park. It's just a beautiful caravan park. Right, I don't recall how yeah. that part of it at all, except <laughs> getting there. <laughs> so, um, so okay, you get to Fitzroy, and then I guess your next your next big thing is you're making a beeline for Broome. And yeah. this is where things start to fall apart. Yeah, just for you. by the way, one of those two, Fitzroy or Halls Creek, I, I, I remember the, the the rubbish around one of the in one of the towns at the time. And I said to one of the business people in one of the, and it might have been Halls Creek. Um, I said to them, "Don't you people ever pick up the rubbish here?" And the answer, the reply was, "Why bother? They only throw it down again." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's um, yes, Kimberley's just fascinating. There's yeah. there's something like I've 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 lived in the Pilbara and the Kimberley. There's just something about these two places. I'm not sure if it's the landscape or the people. You definitely feel there's something special. There is, yes. Yeah, yes. I think yeah, every Australian. I think the head isolation it makes makes it different, doesn't it? It's yeah. the people. The people are different. They lose their. You know, the city ways and speed and everything, and everything mm. slows down, and mm. everyone's relaxed. And, and you got the spin effects, spin effects, and, oh, you, and you got the, the, you know, the soil, and yeah. yeah. Anyway, mate, you're making a beeline for Broom, and um, things start to fall apart. Now, this is the most dangerous part of your whole journey, and um, you've got real hip problems. So, to to help you with your hip, you're hanging, you're doing the hanging thing. Every, most days, most every, every day, and sometimes twice a day. Yep. And it was working all the way. It was it was working well. You know, you learn to relax once you get up there and you're hanging, and you learn to relax, and you can just feel the clicks in your spine, which helps keep everything in line. Mm. You need everything in line when you're doing what I'm doing. And um, but over there, it just wasn't working. I, I just wasn't getting those little clicks in the spine, and I just couldn't relax, and I was getting very tight in the body. 
And um, I didn't know, but it turned out that I had a twisted hip. Uh, was it a, a dislocated hip or a twisted? Oh, I don't recall now. It was, yep. out, of, it was out of line anyway. Yeah, so it, it seems that... You know, these other this this foot fracture. So the stress fracture, you could kind of run through, but this hip really stopped you in your tracks. It was probably the, the, the sore foot that caused it. You know, probably running yeah. and, uh, and trying to nurse it a bit, and probably caused the hip to. Yeah, but it seems you were just dragging yourself into broom, and it, there was a. It seems like things really turned with you and the crew because. It, it was very obvious the way you were running that you were in pain, and there's mm. no way, there's no way you could make the rest of the trip if if you couldn't sort this out. And it seems that um, it seems that you were prepared. <laughs> like your spirits must have been pretty low coming into Broome, right? Oh well, yes, yeah. When when you get to that point, because I've always had some low back and hip discomfort all my life, it seems. And, and I, I just knew from experience that when I get like that, I really needed a bit of help to straighten it out. Um, and I, when you're home, you can go to a chiropractor or a naturopath, someone like that, and they can do that. But out there, you'd think, well, it's not going to be anybody, is yep, there? Yeah. Now, can you tell us this amazing story of how you, you met someone who, who put you onto a chiropractor and can you just talk us through? Yeah, I'll tell you how I see it. Uh, the book says it's slightly different but then the crew saw things differently and, and they may have spoken to this person before I did but it seemed to me that I was the first one to meet this person but perhaps not. Um, but it doesn't matter, the end result, the, the, the story is still the story. I'm, I'm running along the road by myself at this time and this beaten up a little old car comes along and I'm looking at it, and, and as it got close, and uh, I could see this big lady behind the wheel. And next thing I could see dogs. And, and she hops out of this beaten up old car, and five cattle dogs get out. And I thought, oh no, I don't know if I can handle this. You know, someone with five cattle dogs running around everywhere. <laughs> and, and she said, I hear you're in trouble. Well, yeah, I am a bit. I'm hobbling a bit. She said, come with me. I'm taking you into Broome to a chiropractor. <laughs> really? Chiropractor in Broome? She said, yes. And so anyway, she um, takes us into Broome and on the way in, I don't know whether I must have gotten in her car or whether she said this before we got in the car, but anyway, um, I said, how come you got a chiropractor in Broome? From what I hear, Broome's um, just a little, today's Broome's nothing like it was in 83. They, sure. they still had lean to, tar with tarps over them, selling the best pearls in the world in Broome in those days. Now they've got flash shops locked up and everything. And um, she said, come with me. I said, really, a chiropractor in Broome? How come? Oh, well, he, he left his family business in Perth and he come to Broome. I thought, oh, well, he must have had a blue with his family or something or other, perhaps. Who knows? I don't know. And, um, and, and he, he works at the meatworks. Oh, no, <laughs> works at the meatworks. Oh, I'm really in trouble now. And so we're heading to a caravan park and he lives in a caravan as well. So, oh, gee, not a very good chiropractor by the sounds of it. Well, he was incredibly good and he was up there escaping life and from the city to have a break, to get himself back together and just relax, you know. And ah, I walked out of there really good. Uh, the crew out the, outside could hear the noise. He, he whacked the two bones at the low back there and he said your hip was crooked. Yep. I think that's the words he used, actually, hip was crooked. And um, I've straightened you up. He said, you'll be right till you get home now. Gee whiz. So, mate, you must be thinking... <laughs> God, there's this guy who works at the meat works. He's living in this caravan, um, and you hear he does. He's a bit of a chiropractor. He must have thought this. It sounds a little bit sus. Like you must think, well, is chiro is is, is, he, is it just his hobby that he, he yeah. cracks backs? Is it a bit of a. <laughs> but at that point, mate, you were that desperate. I had no choice. What else are you going to do? What else are you going to do? This is it. This <laughs> is it. And, hey, talk about a miracles. I've, I've said I could preach for half an hour on miracles that happened on this run. Unbelievable. That's, that's the big one. That was the big one. 
Was there immediate relief when yeah. he fixed oh, yeah. you up? I, 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 I got to the turn off to Broome. I didn't run into Broome because it's off the highway. I'm running Highway 1 around Australia, see, so I'm going along and the turn off is to Broome. And I wanted to have a go into Broome too, to have a little look. And um, I, I, I run down the road like a 90-year-old and, and when I came back to the spot to keep going, I was running down the road like a nine-year-old. I was great. Mm. Real good. Wow. So that must have it must have been euphoria because not only have you got to Broome, you've um, you've sorted out your hip and all yeah. of a sudden there's a sense of hope. Oh yes, yes. And hanging upside down kept it good after that and it was it was good. It was marvellous, yeah. Yeah, I remember a fella come along after that, um, uh, from Norway or Sweden or somewhere. And, and we just got chatting and he run with me a bit and I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Whereas just prior to that, anyone stopping to talk to me was almost too much to handle, mm. so to speak, you know, just because you're in discomfort and, and, and concerned about how you're going to fix it. I don't think I ever once really thought, this is it, uh, it's over. But I just thought, this is going to be hard work if I've got to put up with this for the rest of the trip yeah. kind of thing, you know. So... Um, yeah, you never really ever think of you, you're not going. You're not yep. going. Yep. I guess just reading the book, Ron, from an outsider's perspective and the crew's perspective, it looked like you're in really bad shape coming into Broome. Mm. Even though mentally you might have still been there, um, it, it didn't appear that you were running that well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is, this is terrific. So um, now... You're heading south, so you've gone all the way up north, gone all the way to Townsville, all the way across to Darwin, all the way across to Broome, and now it's this massive trip down. So, can you talk us? Can you any memories of um, heading down from Broome? I guess your next step would be probably uh, would be Port Hedland Port and, and Carrara. Yes, yes, Port Hedlands. I. I don't have any memories. I don't think we stayed long at Port Headlands. It didn't look all that exciting at that time. Uh, Caratha was another story. It was amazing, like a modern town. I wanted to go to Dampier too, by the way. Broome and Dampier, we, we, we sort of learned a lot about those places at school growing up as kids. Mm. Um, you, you learn a lot about early Australia and the, oh, those sort of places, a, a, a Pearling and Broome and then Dampier for... Well, Dampier was one of the uh, early Dutchmen, wasn't he, or something like that? I used to know, kind of forget now. But I wanted to go there because that's the old part, and um, but but Carrara was the modern part. So anyway, I'm running down the highway, and and you go into this these places, and 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 sitting there on at the turn off to Dampier and Carrara is is, is this um, Rolls Royce, old Rolls Royce. Well. Wasn't old, I suppose. Then it, it would be near. Uh, and and there's a fella there, and I'm coming up, and I think, oh, he's just waiting to say hello. And sitting on the bonnet of his car is a, is a silver tray with silver goblets and champagne. <laughs> uh, and he's a member of the Hash House Harriers from oh, yeah. Karata. Yeah. Come out to give, pour me some champagne and then the crew come along and we all had this and he said right let's go into town we've got uh, everyone's waiting to see you in town and we're going to have lunch at the resort there or hotel or whatever it was they had in those nights all pretty flash from my memory yeah so it seems like you encountered some real luxury you weren't expecting oh, it but you came no, across this luxury unbelievable now this guy in the in the flash <laughs> car was he a, a businessman yeah or, yeah right yeah. so we had a bit of money and, yeah i'd say so yeah yeah, yeah rolls royce i'd say so and yeah. the silver goblets and trays not everybody has that around yeah wow and, uh, you know, it yeah. seemed that you're really taken with carafa and yeah. And there was quite a few strong runners there too. You said that the running club were Oh, well, that was the other thing. Yeah, I'd never heard of this in my life before. Something like um, all over Western, Western Australia, there were running clubs in all these little towns, very hot little towns in the summer and even in the, when I was there. And, and they would have these wheelbarrow races and, and, and they'd, they'd cover thousands of kilometres, hundreds anyway, and sometimes thousands with wheelbarrows 
Wow. You have somebody in it. Um, I used to know exactly how they did it, and, and it became a big thing in the time. You don't hear about it today. Even way up at um, Tom Piper and places, these running clubs, and and the, the, the these athletes would come from all over the world to work there in Western Australia. Like, they weren't just Australians. They were from all parts of Europe and Canada and America. Yeah. And so they'd come from running backgrounds over there, and they'd want to do it out in the deserts. Because most of Western Australia is semi-desert. It's just sand just about meets the sand of the ocean, the desert sand and the sea sand. And they'd cover these huge distances, pushing wheelbarrows. And when it first started, they thought, oh, you had to be an ultra runner to do it. So they'd have all these long-distance runners doing it. But as time went by... They started thinking, hey, let's get faster men in this because you can have a team of so many people, whatever it was, but we'll change more often. So that rather yeah. than have one bloke going for a long time and then change, we'll, we'll do it faster. And they got down to something like a few hundred metre sprints in wow. the end. And, and they'd be having the crew on the side of, of, of a vehicle with a, no door or something so they could jump out and take it and he could jump in. It got down to such fine point for winning it become <laughs> a big thing the different mining companies yeah. all wanted to be the champion wheelbarrow racer you or whatever. said that you said there's some people from new south wales that they flew over oh, to yeah. compete and and vice versa western australians ended up going to new south wales for yeah. some of these events it was unbelievable stuff and you wouldn't ever have heard about it back home you had to be out there to hear about it but they were excited about it too. It's just your classic sort of Aussie larrikin event. You, you, you'd think, Ron, you know, only in Australia would you have a wheelbarrow race like this. Only and, in Australia. And, um, yes. and this must have been just a massive distraction away from the everyday monotony mm. of your run, just to have this energy and mm. meet other people. And it's, it's quite quirky, this, this race, this other event. Yeah, well, all down the West Coast, uh, there'd be groups of runners that come out to see me just because they were part of this wheelbarrow business as well, you know, so they were interested. And they'd travel for a long distance just yeah. to say hello and then head back. Now, these firefighters from Melbourne, were yeah. they a part of this wheelbarrow race or no, something separate? No, that was totally separate. That was, um, now, what was the fire? They were, they were runners or were they cyclists? I thought, were, I thought it was running, but it was running. like almost like a tag. A yeah, relay. oh yes, it was. It was. It was a, a relay tag. It was. A, it was a relay with several people, but around they, the country, right? Oh yes, yeah, the around whole the, country. Yeah. Oh yeah. yes, and and again, well, that's that'd be right. They were they were runners. Yeah, and 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 while I was doing the run, we had one come the opposite direction. Mm. That's yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. Um, and, and they were running, and, and again they got down to shorter, faster, changing regularly yeah. idea to 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 because the records got quite fast. Same with cycling over the time. Some of the records for cycling around Australia got mm. to be very fast. Mm. Yeah, so I think they must have been raising money for charity. This this oh this yes Melbourne oh, Firefighters, yes. and they'd each do a leg pretty quickly. Oh, they and they'd, they'd tap out and someone else would come in. And they, they ripped around <laughs> Australia very quickly. Very fa well, in fact, now you mention that, one of the blokes in that team um, came out of some distance out of Melbourne and run into Melbourne with me. Mm -hmm. One of the blokes that was in that team. Gee, that's just come back. I hadn't yeah. thought about that yeah. in a long, long time. He did. Yeah, and they, they, yeah. they organised... Um, yeah, they met up with you in, in Melbourne when you eventually yes, got there. Yes, yes, they did. Before we get there, mate, yeah, so and, and there was a sense, mate, that when you got into the Pilbara in places like Port Hedland and Caratha, um, you got a sense of this, uh, the mining activity, and you got a sense that this is a pretty big part of the economy, this oh, yes. mining iron ore, and it's yeah. actually it's a huge part of the, the global economy and, and the story of China. I know when I was up there... Uh, working in Newman, um, yeah, you, a lot of Australians don't realise how um, how impressive this oh, yes. place. Just to see the infrastructure, and you see, uh, you probably wouldn't have got a chance, Ron, but on the horizon of Port Hedland, you can just see lights on the horizon, and there's usually 15, 20, 30 boats just lined up, wow, like yeah. in a parking yes, lot. I've heard. Sometimes they're there yeah. for weeks, yes. and they're waiting to come into yeah. port, 
get the iron ore yeah. and go back to China. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So um, <laughs> oh. that was great, mate. So uh. pretty, pretty boring. It's a god. It's a boring trip from. In the car, anyway, it's a pretty boring trip. From <laughs> it's worse on foot. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty boring, mate, and um, there's not a whole lot of variation. I know from Broome to Port Hedland, oh, it's oh yes, yeah. you would have passed through Sand Sandfire. You oh yeah, s- yeah. Sand- oh well, we had a nice time there too. They welcomed us. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Roadhouse there. Oh, they they. I don't think we paid for a thing there. They were very generous. Yeah. Mm. I, and that, yeah, that's good. That's good. And you can't quite see the Indian uh, Ocean, can you? You're so close you, to you it. You don't see it much at all. No, no. If you look at the map, you, you're so close yeah. to it. I know driving, yeah. you just you just can't quite no, see it. No, no, no. That's the pity of it, isn't it? A little bit the same with uh, the Nullarbor. You don't quite see the. You've just got to go off the road a bit, mm. which I didn't have much time or will to. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think you, it was a pleasant change because there's a bit more humidity as oh, you got well, it's, closer to Oh, well, heading to Perth too. And of course, that's. that's a big thing and, and and my mother and son were coming out to see me at Perth so coming down the west coast wasn't all that bad and of course I just had my hip fixed and I felt yep. good and it was all right and then you get to Geraldton and suddenly you're starting to see the wheat you know crops growing and things seem to uh, for, for a lot of people they'd think wow it's pretty barren here but for me it was Starting to pick up pretty yeah, nice because it, it's sort of it seems in 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 the book too and from your perspective this is the first sort of signs of you know human civilization mm. in a sense to see mm. cropping because a large part of WA you're, you're running or you're driving and it's this there is honestly there's no sign of um, of human existence oh terrible terrible nothing. I'd go days with almost nothing in fact. There were many, many stretches of not a bend in the road, 50 and 60 kilometres of not a bend in the road. For, for interest, I'd, I'd, you'd see a sign way ahead and you'd start having guessing games with yourself what that sign said. And it only said one of two things, floodway or grid. It was one or the other. And so I'd have bets with myself which one it was before I could see it properly. That's how exciting it got. On June 17, at Dead Cow Gully, we are hosting the Australia Backyard Masters. This event will be simply epic. We have signed up the best backyard runners in this country. Plus, we have the ultra running legend, Harvey Lewis, flying over from the US. We also have the NZ7, which is a team of elite Kiwi runners who wanna take on the Aussies. This will be a showdown for the ages, but we need your help. Most of the interstate and overseas runners don't have crew or any equipment. They're literally jumping on the plane and turning up to the event. So if you can help us out with some equipment like a marquee or a chair, or if you could volunteer as crew, we would love to hear from you. Can you please get in contact if you can help out? Just send me a message on 0439 779. We would really love your help and they would be forever grateful. Thank you. Well, Ron, well, um, what we might do, because, yeah, the, the Karatha seemed to be a highlight and we'll just, we might skip a few towns, mate, and we might um, talk about um, Perth. So... Mm. You, you, you make you make it to Geraldton. You said there's some signs of uh, signs of human civilization in the sense that you can see some crops. A lot of that's a big wheat, big wheat area. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? stuff growing and mm. you know, more homes popping up. Not many, I mean, but you might yeah. see a couple of homes each day instead of nothing. And and I saw my first sturt desert pea growing ah. on the side of the road. Right, I'd, I'm. Not a gardener much, but um, oh, gee, to see a Sturt Desert Pea, <laughs> well named after Sturt the Explorer. And yeah, did you see some wildflowers? Um, not a lot. I don't recall a lot of wildflowers um, inland. A little bit from there, I think there's a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that that's obviously got to lift your spirits when you sort of feel that mm. you're not you're not alone. You can see cropping. Um, you don't feel as alone and isolated. 
and then you come come into Perth. Any any impressions of Perth, mate? As you as you ran in, did you get a big reception? Um, no, not not that big. I don't. But my mother and son. That's right. That's Lee really cool. had turned up in Perth. They flew over to see me, and they travelled out to Meriden. With That's right. The crew. So that was that was really something with Perth. Um, and we took a, a moment to whip up to um, the park, Kings Park, is it, yep. overlooking Perth? Beautiful park. Really nice, yeah. Yeah, but I don't recall any big reception there, strangely enough, but the biggest cities, you don't expect it. It didn't happen, not like Darwin. Mm, yeah, that's those. right. Yeah. So um, it seemed that you are quite impressed with Perth as a city. You said it was quite scenic and... and yes. Um, yeah, per- Perth's a, Perth's a, a lovely, lovely city. Lovely yeah, Swan place. River, so, and you would have went. You went out to Fremantle, I believe, to check out the docks there at Fremantle. Yeah, uh-huh. did I go or the crew went? Well, maybe the crew. I, I went. think the crew might have done that. I didn't do any more than I had to. So you're starting yes. to get a bit more media exposure because the big world records coming up. You go to Perth, um, but the. The, the celebrations don't really start until you actually get to to Meriden, which is a which is a sort of a wheat a wheat town. It's on the wheat belt, right? Yes, um, yes. So my thoughts were suddenly broken. One minute there was no one around me except my support runners. Then I was swamped in a sea of faces, cheers and shouting as about a hundred school children from the Meriden High School joined me. As I ran near the sale yards. I stopped to go to the toilets there. You should have heard those kids giggling and chattering. They hadn't thought that even world record holders are, are humans after all. <laughs> it was a happy, humorous moment during the last stage of the run into the township. I stopped one k- kilometre from the centre of the town to mark time and let the slow runners catch up. The kids could catch their breath before they made the charge with me to the finish tape as they surely will. By now, another four schools had joined us. I turned the last corner into the main street and I was so surprised. I had been glad that the record was to be broken in a little country town, so I never expected to see so many people. It was estimated later at about 2,500 uh, 2, people. Incredible but thrilling. So um, yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at the photos here, and it seemed to be um, just a huge thing for you, and you actually got quite emotional in in Meriden. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, it was a big thing and a big relief, you know, to know that you'd passed the old world long run record, mm. and uh, yeah, whatever happened after that, I had something behind me. <laughs> you locked this in the bag, and it seemed that you had a real affinity for. Um, for Meriden itself, and I think you said too that um, for a um, for a baker's son, mm-hmm. it, was qu- it was quite fitting too because it's a wheat town. Oh, exactly. My father was a baker, and my son is a baker, and and at, he was there. He was there in that town with my mother, and uh, he's still a baker to this day. He was doing his apprenticeship at the time, so it was very fitting. And and um, I own bakeries and bread runs and various things. So, yeah, amazing, quite amazing. I mean, it could have been anywhere, couldn't it? Mm. But it was there. Mm. Yeah, mate, I'll just read a little bit more for, for the listeners. Um, so school school kids were coming out and writing poems for you and – and um, I looked around me, Mum, Dell, and several others had tears in their eyes and the girls presented the poem to me and it had a, st- a, a sketch of a runner on it drawn by Tanya. I don't really know if I thanked them enough that day, but I want them to know it meant a lot to me. They had followed my run from the start then thought up of the idea of the poem and carried it out. Their teacher was very proud of their... Um, initiative and felt it would be a turning point for both girls who were rather shy. So you had all these different ceremonies and um, you said, I went to bed that night feeling that I ought to pinch myself just to see if the fantastic events of today had really happened and Ron Grant really was the holder of the new world long run record. Tomorrow I set my sights on home and hopefully become the first person to run around Australia. 
So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you feel? Um, mm -hmm. Sort of bring back some memories? Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 40 years ago, yeah, it's a long time back, but mm. it, it does. And, and the many things you do forget, you know. You, mm. Yeah, There's a, They put a little plaque up in the park where where all the celebrations happened. I, I often wonder if it's still there. Most things don't survive 40 yeah, years, but they did. Interesting. They actually put a plaque up in the park there. Well, if anyone listening's from Meriden, if you can go check it out and, and yeah. tell us if it's still there. What, what's the name of the park? Do you know? Or? No, I don't know, but yeah, it's not a right. very big town, and I'd say there's one. it was right in the middle of the town. So mm. Mm. so seeing your your son, your son met you in, in Meriden or Perth? Perth. Um, yeah. Mum and Lee came out to Perth, and mm. Lee joined the crew all the way to Meriden, and then Mum came and went each day yeah. from Perth, yeah. yeah. Wow. So that must have been a huge psychological <laughs> oh, yes. boost. Right? It was good. It was real nice, yes. And then my daughter Debbie came out to Adelaide for a short visit too, so that was good. Mm. Yeah, wow. So, I mean, so many things could have gone wrong, um, Ron. So, I mean, just the fact that you didn't get injured, uh, every step, it seems that like you're cautious the whole way. And it, it, it paid dividends. Yes, yes, yes. And that's a big strain, you know. I mean, most of us get up and we go and do this and do that and you don't think too much of it. Your footing and all that, of course, you're not silly about it, but, but you don't think. But, but on that, just the whole time, cautious of rolling an ankle, the edge of the bitumen, mm. stepping out of your van and not thinking and overstepping or falling yeah. down or who knows, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you got the new world record for the longest ever continuous run. And I might say that um, this was very challenging because a, lo a lot of that run was 30 plus, 30 plus degrees, probably. We had roughly 100 days from Rockhampton around to um, Port Hedland, Broome, somewhere around there, roughly 100 days of 30 plus every day. Yeah. So we're not, we're not talking about, um, you know, r running. Running on a on a twenty two twenty three degree day, you had <laughs> back to back hot days, so That's it right. makes it even more impressive. That's right. The fact well, that you did that, and and it, well, you're on the bitumen, so it's probably a whole lot hotter. I mean, you know, you take um, the Australian Open tennis in Melbourne. They, they they talk about the weather in Melbourne being thirty thirty five degrees, but on that tennis court, it's probably forty degrees or so. So yeah. on the bitumen where I was, who knows what it was? It was probably hotter than thirty, but ah. Uh, it's I'd say it'd have to be at least five to ten degrees hotter, wouldn't uh, it? Oh yes, for sure, for sure. Mm. And, and and so it's it's a struggle. I mean, it's a big struggle. But I prepared for all that. I did a lot of training in the heat and what have mm. you in the middle of the day and all that. So I didn't just train early and late. I got out in the middle of the day and mm. and prepared myself. Right. So um, a bit emotional. You've got the record. You see your family. Um, Life's good. How do you then um, regather your thoughts and your focus to start mm -hmm. to start heading east towards oh, well, the Malibu? It's, it's pretty good. I mean, I'm going home, aren't I? Yeah. No more big bends. Pretty yeah. much going home yep. across the country and going north, but it's still going home. I'm not going away from home. Up until Perth, I was going away from home. Oh, good point. And good and point. it's it's amazing, you know, just the. How and it changes your yeah, it changes your attitude and your outlook wow. to everything. Wow, <laughs> you're actually heading back home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess your, your next stop would have been your big thing would have been Kalgoorlie. I yes. think that's about seven hundred k's. Yes, I didn't. Uh, they, uh, we drove into Kalgoorlie just because I wanted to. Again, hearing a lot about it at school, school days, and all that. Uh, no, hang on, Kalgoorlie. Yeah, yeah, Kalgoorlie. We went run into it was no. Cool Guardy we run to and we drove yeah. into Kalgoorlie. That's, That's right. right. They're quite That's close right. together. They're, they're close together, but I yeah. wanted to see the other one, but I didn't have to run to it. Gotcha. Um, I was following Highway 1, so we went in to, yeah, just to say we've been. Gotcha. <laughs> and you, you obviously didn't have you didn't have a chance to, to do any sightseeing. Not really, no, no, no. no. I, I, I really needed to concentrate on being on that road or is it, pretty much if you're an ultra-distance runner, you pretty much got to think, move forward or sit down or lay down. Mm -hmm. Don't do too much of in between, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, look, um, I think we might speed things up a bit, mate. So um, you, you get to the Nullarbor and um, 
to a lot of people, this would be the hardest, one of the hardest no. parts, but there's actually quite a bit to see. Oh, a lot to see. The Nullarbor is not as barren as everyone makes out. No. Go up into the northwest. Go to... <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good. I, I came to a service station every two days on the Nullarbor. Yeah, great. Oh, mate, that's a luxury. <laughs> that's a luxury. Oh, for good. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, we pulled into the Nullarbor service station. I think it was called the Nullarbor service station. There's a few of them. And we go in, get our milkshake or whatever it was, and a, a girl speaking a foreign language, uh, you know, you could tell she was a foreigner, a German, I think, and, and, and said, are you Ron Grant? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, oh, there's mail here for you. Oh, right. <laughs> mail found me on the Nullarbor Plains. Oh. And one of the letters was from a German in German, German, written in the lang- language, which I couldn't read. And somehow or other they'd gotten my name and on the front right and, and uh, round Australia runner, and it yeah, arrived over there. So this lady who f- didn't sound Australian um, sort of read it enough to be able to tell me what it was. Mm-hmm. I, I guess she was in German because it was, the letter was in German. German writing, um, she was Austrian or something or other, and she could read enough to tell me roughly what it said, which was a um, nice letter, which I would still have somewhere at home. Oh, terrific! Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the Nullarbor. There's actually there's you know there's a bit to see. Oh, and sure. You've obviously got a straight section of the road, but I, did, I'd get driven down to the water. Uh, yeah. In that, which was pretty close, and yep. and the Great Australian Bight, and you're looking mm. down these huge cliffs and. There'd be seals and things down there and all this, yeah, That's the perfect. wild ocean. It was, it was good. Yeah, I'd love to go good. back there, actually. Yeah. Um, so did you experience, I know there's a lot of wind. There's a heap of wind mm. down Nullarbor. Did you come across wind. some headwinds or oh, sidewinds? Or? Wind, headwind. It, it, it seemed to me like I had headwind all the way from Perth to Sydney, but I didn't, obviously. But, but it seemed like I either headwind or sidewind. Mm. And sometimes they're strong um, Southern Ocean side winds are very hard. You've got to brace yourself. You run, you're sort of running all day braced against the side wind hitting you. Mm. Very, very hard. So you're putting extra pressure on, on your oh, for sure. on your left or your right foot. Yeah, one yeah. way or another, you're putting pressure on the body yeah. somewhere to, to brace. Yeah, because I know the wind, the wind can actually blow over you know, trucks and caravans down there quite easily. Oh, most definitely, yes. And then when a truck had come along and you're on roads and you can't always get off because there might be a vehicle coming the other way, and you get buffeted by the vehicles as well sometimes, mm-hmm. I'd have to get right off the road because mm-hmm. I was, you know, in my weakened state. Um, I couldn't always stand up to it. Yeah. So I'd be getting off the road. Mm-hmm. To, uh, get away. So do you know if in these headwinds, um, did you actually enter another mental low, like just, just because it it's it seems that um, you don't really feel like you're making much progress when you when you're running into the wind, right? Like, well, well, you feel like you're battling all the time, um, but you know, yeah, I, I I don't recall feeling quite as low mentally as I did up in the north there. Sometimes mm. the flies and the heat. Yeah. Um, in fact, it got quite cold at times. Mm. One time down there somewhere in the south, I, I jumped into a phone box because the crew and no one was about and I saw this phone box and I was freezing and the wind was so bad and I jumped in the phone box and waited a while thinking, oh, I'll wait till the crew come, hope they don't pass before I have a chance to wave them down. So they came along and I had to get in the van and spend some time in there warming up. I was actually... Very, very, very cold. It gets cold down there. Oh, sure. Like you got, um, you just got that cold chill coming straight off the uh, straight off Antarctica. Yeah. That that wind oh, coming up, just terrible, just terrible. Yeah. I, I found the uh, cheap, good old cheap plastic raincoat, the best thing of all, the long ones that hang long down close to your knees, sort of thing, to keep the wind off you. It wasn't so much, yeah. The wind was extremely forceful and bad. Yeah. So at least you don't have to run with the fly net. So oh, no. Do, do you know when you actually took the fly net off? Was it around um, um, after after Tennant Creek? Did you just dip, ditch yeah, the... Yeah, I don't think well, I used the fly net much after that. The fly, a certain amount of flies was okay because even with the fly net, 
some flies still get in. you still got a few anyway. And uh, no, I think pretty much after the three ways, I did away with the fly net because yep. they're pretty uncomfortable. They, yep. they, they hold the heat too. Yep, yep. Mm. Did you, because um, you weren't running with a hat, um, did you ever get, you must have got sunburned. Yeah, I got sunburned. I, I should have worn more clothing most of the time, but I didn't. I didn't like covering too much. Um, but I did put a long sleeve shirt on a certain amount and put a hat, but I, I yeah, not enough. I, I got quite burnt. I got plenty of skin cancers. <laughs> yeah. But you had a big mop of hair, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I always, I've always worn my hair a bit yeah. on the long side. <laughs> so your, ne- your, your hair was kind of covering your neck. Oh, yeah. yeah. The only, in my neck and, and ears, the only place I don't have skin cancers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, and um, – <laughs> You weren't running with sunglasses? Never wore them. Never wear them. Really? Never wear them. Not in the desert, Simpson Desert, anywhere. Oh. Never never worn sunglasses. Why, why is that? Is I, there any I reason just, for I just that? don't like things on me. I just, oh, really? I, you know, us runners back in the day, if we could get away with a pair of shorts and nothing else, that's what we did. Yeah. We didn't wear, carry, do anything else. Hats, sunglasses, none of it. Did you ever experiment with running with sunglasses? And no. You- you never said you tried it no. once and said I just don't like it, or you. Don't, I don't remember ever trying them. Yeah, wow. maybe I did, but if I did, I don't know. I I, I, I never felt the need. I never never have, <laughs> and and I don't have prescription glasses to read or anything. Oh wow! Yeah, well, very very. I just have the cheapies around sometimes if yeah. it's a bit dark and. Might want it, but I could read that book you've got there now. This is light enough, but if it's a bit darker, I might yeah. need the cheapies. You know the magnifying glass type thing yeah. for some things but no so so going without sunglasses hasn't affected my eyes my terrific very very minimalist uh, right? well well yes yeah that's right that's yeah, yeah 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 very easy to cater for mate <laughs> um okay let's let's speed it up a bit you get across to Nullarbor you go into Sydney it seems that you yeah Adelaide you, first oh, oh, sorry sorry got to go to Adelaide sorry Adelaide <laughs> It seems you didn't really get much of a reception, and it, it it reads it reads like Adelaide didn't really know you were coming. No, coming no, in. they didn't. They weren't very and interested. No, you're sort of running in. You're looking around. Yeah. And it's like no one's really lining the streets, and then you have this mm. small reception in um, in in the centre of the city. But it, it seems that um, word really hadn't gotten to Adelaide about. No, you. no, no. There you go. It's just a matter of somebody. There was no Sally Alston like up in Broome coming out mm. in a little old beaten up car with five dogs or anything like that. Nothing. Yeah. No. Ex- oh well. Well, before Adelaide, Margaret Carline, who wrote that book you're looking at, uh, turned up. Or well, Margaret Carline was a lady in her sixties or sixty or thereabouts, and was she alive? Why, my goodness. She uh, she would brighten up my days when she turned up. She turned up and said, "I'd like to write a book about your run around Australia." Oh, really? Mm. So that and that was somewhere close to Adelaide. And uh, okay, she, do you, so you had no idea who this woman no, was? No, well, I'd been warned by by John Thompson, who had, was helping out with things, mm. um, that that she wanted to do a book and that she was coming to meet me. Mm-hmm. And so she turned up and. Uh, she was great. Uh, in fact, we kept in touch all the years since that until she passed away. Yeah, wow. Came to Anne and I at my wedding and uh, years later and, and, and we visited her and, uh, yeah, we, 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 we stayed good friends ever since. But, but she was a live wire of a lady and I'm 40 and she's in her 60s and I'm thinking, to me, she was an old lady, you know, but she wasn't, obviously. <laughs> she she she. she talked a lot and I thought how is she listening to anything I say she's talking so much well she didn't miss a thing I said she really? remembered everything and she never took notes in front of me mm. and she I never saw any tapes or anything and so she yep she just had a switched on mind that absorbed so much obviously as soon as she left me she probably jotted down all she needed but so did you know she was going to meet you to discuss um a future book. I'd only just heard recent, just prior to that, gotcha. and it all happened quite fast, you know. Yep. And did she want to hang out with you to get a feel of of what it was like? A bit, yes, on the she road? did. She she came and went a little bit, um, not for too long. She came and went, and then she went back to uh, her home in Brisbane, and and she went around interviewing a lot of my friends and family after that, and and got a feel for mm. me and growing yep. up and yep. running and. 
Because your book, your book does read like a diary entry. That's right. Day that was, by day. That was by her day. input. That yeah. So she obviously got some notes from the oh, crew. Oh, the diary. Yeah, the crew. Well, Sandra kept a lot of notes too yep. on that uh, trip. Um, yep. She kept a lot of notes, and she yep. got from that, and then she talked with me and yep. and um, the crew all over, and then great people back home. Great. Right, and then um, so then you make a beeline for. For Melbourne, and it, it seems um, it seems that you think, God, this is where this is where you can really feel um, human civilization kick in because you come across traffic. Mm. Like most oh. of your time, you don't have much traffic, and then you come from uh. it's from from Adelaide to Adelaide to Melbourne. This is where you start to feel the big push of yes. like traffic. Yes, yeah. You've got to deal with traffic all the way trucks. home really compared to the rest of the country. And when you've been out in the quieter areas, you notice it a lot too and it's all yep. fast, you know, it's yep. very, very fast. So, we, we, yeah, there was lots of it. So um, you'd be used to running in the middle of the road. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. But now you've got to now – Stay well over. Yep. And, and, and of course, back in those days, there, there wasn't that nice side bit uh, uh, over the – past the white line that you could run on either, um, maybe occasionally, but for most part there wasn't. So you're running in the stone to get away from yeah. the traffic. So it was pretty hard. It was great going out of uh, Adelaide, over the Adelaide Hills and, and you know, and what's, the, what's that, Hundur? No, the German settlement oh, there. Oh, yeah, 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 and it's beautiful. Lovely. It was really, really nice getting out of Adelaide and the hills and everything. So much so that I thought to myself, I've got to come back here and have a good look around. And and Anne and I have gone down there quite a lot to Adelaide and the whole area and, and all around there and and mm. uh, had a good look, a real good look. Beautiful areas. Yeah. Different, different uh, Queensland. but Oh, yeah. It's actually quite dry down there too. Very it? dry, yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the early, the early settlers and the homes and, uh, and uh, following Sir Sidney Kidman and where he lived and where he had the big horse sales north of Adelaide, you know, north of the Barossa Valley and all that, also close to Adelaide, but mm. all the areas that I couldn't see when I was running around, of course. Mm. Uh, mm. That was good. That was good. So the side of the right, you, do you call it, is it a camber? Camber, the cam- Cam- camber. The, all roads have camber. They slope slightly so there's no yeah. water settling. Yeah. And so you're on this slope all the time. And in the quieter areas, you can change sides or run in the middle to get away from the slope, which helps you. But when you're in the busy areas, you're on this one mm. right-facing slope all the time. So yeah. when, when you're, when you're um, in, a, in a vehicle, you don't notice, no, you don't notice no. the camber. But when you're running, you it's do. a slight lean – and it's that pressure yeah. on that, yes. on the left or the right, depending on where you are. Whichever on the right. side. And fortunately for me, being on the right hand side of the road seems to favour my hip a little. Mm-hmm. Not still not better. It's better to be flat, but it, being on the left side really doesn't favour my hip at all. Mm-hmm. So uh, being on the right was that was a bit of an advantage. Yep. Mm. So if the if the camber's too steep, that becomes a problem. Oh, real real problem. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. And and then you get off that onto the side, which is flat, but of course it's rough grass or stone or whatever. So you think you're running cross country a certain mm. amount. <laughs> right, mate. You get into Melbourne, pretty good reception. You got the firefighters, a lot of media interest. You now. You're now officially, I guess, you're on the east coast. Oh, I just got to run up the east coast to home. It's you just got to n- head north. N- nearly there. You, can you remember what your feelings were like coming into Melbourne? Oh, I was feeling pretty good because you know it was it, it was a very um, pretty state, Victoria, and, and and the other good thing about Victoria, it's so small, it only took two weeks to run through as well. <laughs> so that was that was rather pleasant. That's against Queensland, Western Australia. And very big states are there for a long, mm. long time. So Victoria was good, even with the traffic. It was really pleasant. Um, the people were nice too. You know, we encountered a lot of very pleasant people coming out to say something they, they heard on the grapevine, even if the big media didn't take a lot of notice at that point. Mm. And I got a phone call um, from Tony Rafferty. Right. And, which was very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good, and there was um, there was hope. Maybe if you got to Melbourne, um, you come back to the east coast. There's a good chance now that you can actually make it home to Brisbane. Mm. And, and the thought was 
surely a big sponsor oh, would jump on board. You'd think so. You know, that was a big stress, you know, thinking here we are, we still don't have a sponsor. Um, what's going to happen? You know, you've got huge debts at the bank, second mortgage to do this run, and what's going to happen? Do I have to sell the house to clear it or what? You know, that part was stressful. But it was good to be relieved of the world long run record, but still got to get home. And um, I remember one of the people who did want to sponsor us was Camel Cigarettes. <laughs> that was a real test of your faith and belief in your, oh, what mate. you believed in. It was so tempting. I remember getting very, very close to saying, yep, take it. <laughs> but um, Would you have to have a puff along the way on the run? <laughs> just uh... <laughs> I'd never even had a cigarette lit in my mouth. Yeah, not wow. even, Not even tried one. So, um, But my father smoked and he always said, don't smoke. Um, and I never did. Um, but that was a little bit tempting, I have to admit. That was a real test of my faith and my beliefs and so forth. And I nearly, uh, I, I must have come pretty close to saying, because, you know, it would have made a, been a big relief to have had that financial burden lifted. I remember Lee Tickle saying to me, Ron, don't, uh, don't give in. You've got your beliefs, you, you know what you're about. That's, that's very cheeky, isn't it? Imagine a cigarette company sponsoring Camel, a runner. Uh, Camel was a bit fitting, actually, you know, being out in the desert as yeah. we were. That's kind of funny. <laughs> that's very cheeky from Camel's behalf. Yes. You're using your lungs every day. Exactly. And, um, that's right. That's right. Exactly right, God. you know. Um, and, and Cadbury's chocolate. Now, I love Cadbury's chocolate, but I almost refused to eat it because they wouldn't sponsor me before we left. <laughs> Our Dead Cow Gully documentary has amassed 100,000 views. That is absolutely crazy. But look, it's not surprising in a sense because it's a beautiful doco which captures the spirit of the gully and inspires people to go out for a run and push their limits. While we love putting out that content, it does cost us some money. We think it's worth the expense, but you can actually help us out. All you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's just one click and it's free. So there is no cost. If we can get more subscribers to our channel, we can monetize and get paid through YouTube advertisements. This will help us pay for future podcasts and documentaries. So please hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much. So it seemed like this was something that was really playing on your mind because um, the, the bills the bills are racking up because oh, you've got yes. to pay for food for everyone in the crew. So it's yourself and what five, six, four, four crew, four myself, crew, yeah, kids, yeah, couple of kids. Yeah. You're paying for fuel. They'd gone it, home by this time, so they right. weren't there. But still, yes, it was a big expense, extremely big expense. Yes. Yep. So and, and the fuel is not just. Um, a smooth trip going all the way around. You're often going back and forth, mm. back and forth oh, yes. into town. So, sure. um, I, I, geez, I'd hate to, I'd hate to know yeah, how many exactly. you, Yeah, I mean, you ran, yeah. you ran um, thirteen thousand three hundred and eighty-three. I wonder what, I wonder how far oh, the cars travel. Enormous amount. Yeah, I mean, oh, I'd only be guessing, but I'd say. <laughs> You know, you could at least add another four or five thousand oh, k's on oh, top. Oh, definitely, right? yeah, probably most, more. More, might say a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, and and you you just a little bit confused why corporate Australia is not jumping on board and and um. Well, bear in mind, back in those days, most sports people didn't get them paid. Like Wally Lewis wouldn't have got paid very well for playing rugby league, and he was yep. the king, wasn't he? I mean, you know, so so it was kind of not. Surprising, really, mm -hmm. and I wasn't too upset about not making money out of it, but it would have been mm -hmm. nice to have been covered mm -hmm. for the costs. Yeah, it would have been really nice. Yeah, do you mind? Do you mind disclosing roughly how much you think it costs you for that? Um, we did. A, I, I don't want to know exactly, but but we did. Someone and myself did do a rough estimate at one stage, and we come up with a figure of about ninety thousand. Whether that could be right yeah. or wrong, or wow. I, I don't know. At the time, and bear in mind, that's 40 years ago, it's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Or 90,000 in 1983. That's equivalent. That's a, that's a, I haven't got the inflation 
calculator in front of me, that's a few hundred thousand dollars. Oh, yes, yeah, it's a lot. It's a, a lot. It's, a, it's a lot of money. Yeah. You've got to bear in mind the vehicles as well and yeah, everything's wearing out. And, mm. Mate, um, it's, um, it is astounding, but in a sense, since no one thought it was possible, from a, from a company's perspective, if they sponsored you from Brisbane and um, you died, you mm. died on the trip, that's not a that's not a great public relations exercise for the company. Oh well, we were told <laughs> we were told directly by a big company that no, we're not going to sponsor you because it can't be done. As yep. simple as that, um, and and you can't blame them because at the time it was front page Courier Mail, it was TV at night, medical profession saying it can't be done. Mm-hmm. Well, you're supposed to believe the medical profession, aren't you? You know, and and I so I'm not blaming them, but. For me, that was um, made me more determined. But for them, it yeah, they didn't know that I was determined. They fired you up. You, yeah, you wanted yeah, to fired pr- me up. Prove them wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the, the one animal is is it can't be done. So if you if you died in the pursuit of it, it's going to ref- reflect badly on the company. But sure. two, if you get injured, if you pull out and don't make it again, it reflects poorly. It reflects badly, yes, badly. exactly. But yes. <laughs> you're on the home stretch now. If you were, I think it would have been a smart move if a company jumped on board and said... Um, yes, you would. God, we could we could ride this tailwind home. Mm, yeah. And um, we doubted Ron the whole way, but we could just... Mm. Right, we could ride on his coattails and actually pick up a lot of publicity here. You would have thought so, but they didn't. Yeah, they, they just didn't. Mm. So I, I thought, oh well, that's life. That's it. Bugger them, bugger them. <laughs> yes. Okay, you leave Melbourne, and it seems like you got a few problems here. Um, you've got more hills because you're on the Great Dividing Range. So you don't really have a whole lot of hills most of the trip, but now mm, you have now hills. Now you've got hills, yeah. I don't mind hills. Uh, I, I, I'm not a great fan of running down steep hills, but uh, uphill, w- did a lot of training on Mount Me out of Caboolture, and, and so hills didn't really trouble me a lot. I suppose sometimes you'd look up and go, oh, no, not another big hill, but didn't really trouble me like some people hate hills, but mm. I kind of like them to a degree. Yep. Yeah. But if you're... Um if you're a few months into the run, yeah, yeah, oh, would a, you still like hills? No, 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 no. I think <laughs> I, I, I remember uh, helping uh, Yanis Kuros winning. When I was I was part of a group running into Melbourne when Yanis Kuros was winning in Sydney, Melbourne, one year after the Route Australia run, and there's a bunch of us around him because he's running in almost finished, and and there's a the Greek community wanted to rush him and push him and touch him and, and the great Yanis Kouros, why not? And um, we're running. And, and one of the blokes says to Yanis Kouros, oh, there's a hill up there, I'll race you up the hill. And Yanis Kouros looks at him. Here he is, he's just come from Sydney, nearly in Melbourne, finishing. And, and, and he said, you want to race me, do you? And Yanis Kouros took off up the hill. He loved hills too. You're kidding. This is during um, the run. Uh, this is the finish after – took him five days, five wow. or six days to run from Mel- Sydney to Melbourne and he took off. He's a character. He's a great bloke. Oh, yeah. And he just challenged. He didn't go too far, of course, but we had to race after him. <laughs> he, was a, he was a once in a oh, hundred year athlete. Unbelievable. Right? Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, you've, you've got some hills to encounter, mate. You still don't have a sponsorship. And then you, you also have some really bad headwinds. Oh. Which – which yeah. really um, upset you. Well, I, well, I thought once I got to Melbourne, it would be a tailwind all the way home because it felt like I had a side wind uh, all across the bottom and it seemed to have headwinds. So uh, I guess they weren't – you know, when you're in that state, you think things are worse than they are sometimes, don't yeah. you? But anyway, we got over it. You get to Sydney, have a big reception there, and um, and – yeah, this is this is the home stretch now. So it's from Sydney to Brisbane, and you think you could probably get excited about this, but in the book it reads that you actually encounter a low that's almost as worse as anything you've experienced um, just out of Sydney. You just you're just not feeling you're not feeling good. Um, you're so close to home, but you've mm. still got to run. But it's a thousand kilometres, and and yeah. I'd already, I already I had already run from Sydney to Brisbane some years back, mm. um, just to to say I did it, 
uh, and it's a, a thousand kilometres is still a long way. Oh. So uh, Absolutely. You, you sort of think in your mind as you're approaching Sydney, oh, it's going to be good after this, but suddenly you're on the road every day stepping it out and it's the same old, same old. Yeah. So, yeah, you get a bit down, but that's but if you, it. If you look at the map, you're so close. Oh, yes. But you've yes. still got a job to do every day. Uh, exactly, and the traffic was heavy. Shocking. Yeah. 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 And it seems that from this stretch from Sydney to – Brisbane, this is where you really start to feel uh, the love and the warmth out there because you're getting lots of toots on the mm. road, people are honking at you, yes. and you're you're really coming home now because you're getting close to the border. I think you, your mood doesn't really shift until you probably hit um, um, maybe maybe it was sort of around Coffs Harbour, maybe, maybe a bit before then. Your mood starts to really shift, and it is really a a bit of a homecoming from there, and you feel like you're home because it's a bit more tropical. Mm. Oh yes, yes, yes. You start to see some fruit yes. stalls on the road. Yes, that's right. It's very, very much home. Uh, and also, we had a visit from a uh, Courier Mail journalist, John Hamilton. I believe his name was. I'm pretty sure I'm right there, John Hamilton. He was a very, very well-known journalist back in the eighties. And he just drove down. He said, "I've just come. To, I've just heard about this, about you, and so forth. And I've just come to see what it's all about." And um, he sat there at a lunch break or whatever it was with me for some time, and mm. and and he left. And next thing, there's an article in the um, Courier Mail. Yep, quite a big article in the Courier Mail about this runner. Uh, but it, but the part he picked up on the most was. The, as you're talking before about the the, the, the the second mortgage and no money and all this, mm. that the part you know, and he and he, he came up with this Aussie battlers thing, mm. um, which I thought here I am, I'm knocking myself out physically, and he's talking about the Aussie battler yeah. <laughs> financially <Yeah. laughs> struggling, uh, and and there was a big article in the paper, and, and it seemed to all change from there. And yeah, it, it seems like that's the first time. Um, uh, the Australian, well, the, the general public became aware of, of of the fact that you took a second mortgage out in your house. You're under financial stress, mm, yeah. and God, it's it's it seems like a bit of a dog act that no one's actually come on board and mm. and sponsored you. So I think there's a lot of outpouring of um, of uh, goodwill as you came into Brisbane. Um, c- can you describe what it was like when you crossed the border? And you, uh, you get to the Gold Coast and all of a sudden um, there's people lining the streets mm, as you come uh, into the Gold Coast. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. They, they're lining the streets and, and in this crowd I saw two fellas from Caboolture, older than me, and um, I said, gee, on holidays or something, no, we come down to see you, get back to Queensland. Mm. They had tears in their eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was something, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it seems that you're meeting people from Caboolture all around Australia. It's people popping up. Yeah, yeah, Who, yeah, who either yeah, um, yeah. their family's from Caboolture or they yeah. were from Caboolture and they were doing Something a trip. like that, yeah, yeah, one way or another. But these two blokes had driven down just as I got over the border. And, mm. and, and also we had a bit of trouble when we got over the border too because some um, – <laughs> Very policeman who was really um, must must sit up at night reading the rule book or something or other saw saw some obscure rule ruling in his uh, rule book that said uh, you you can't uh, tow a vehicle that's got signage on it without uh, per- permission. Well, we had all the permission we needed, but this person didn't think so. So they said you've stopped. You can't go any further. You've got sign writing on that. And <laughs> come on. So, so one of the crew rung, rung um, the premier. Well, I think they tried to, and they eventually got through to him or to someone who talked to the premier, Sir Joe, and he got onto the police commissioner and said, "Let that person go." Oh. <laughs> and we were allowed to proceed. And would you believe? Sir Joe and the police commissioner said, give him a police escort from the border to Brisbane. Mm. Can you believe? Yeah. I had a, I, 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 really, there were times when I wished they'd go away, but I did have a police escort all the way. Well, he would have been the most hated <laughs> copper in, in Australia if he, <laughs> if he stopped you there. 
must and the whole thing was over. I, I don't know who this person was, but uh, must have just come out of police school and was reading the rule book or something, and it was some uh, oh, yeah. 40-year-old obscure. Yeah, let, let the man finish. <laughs> so you get the police escort and people are starting to line the streets and they're, you know, um, in some places, you know, um, a, few, a few metres deep. Oh, and, yeah. Um, yeah, Lee, yeah. Tick, Lee Tickle loved it because he's from the Gold Coast, one of my yep. crew people, and yep. so he uh, thoroughly enjoyed coming through his hometown. Yeah. It seems like you got a few buckets from the from the pubs, and um, <laughs> some runners were, were running ahead of you, and people were throwing money well, into, the, into the buckets. That all started more so from my next day um, from the edge of Brisbane, Mount Cravat area, yeah. in, and the police got buckets and started collecting it. Mm. So I understood, along with uh, other people who came to see mm. me come in. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. They were throwing money at, 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 at us, <laughs> which um, I, I think they raised about $7,000 or something on the wow. way into uh, – back then there was a fair bit of money and it was yeah. enough to keep the bank off my back, you know, until I got back to my business and oh. back to – Earnings yeah. and so forth. And How good is that, mate? Like, oh yes, you yeah. know, I, yeah. I, I'd imagine back in 1983 there would there would have been a lot of battlers out there, and they're handing over their handing oh, over their money to, to it help you. It was incredible all the way into Brisbane from Mount Cravat. People were lining the street everywhere, school children, adults, and mm-hmm. I've still got a little koala at home, about six inches or four inches, and a little schoolgirl run out onto the road and gave to me. Yeah, as, well. as I, I was running into Brisbane. Yeah. Okay, so let's go through the last <laughs> the last night on the road. I imagine. I mean, how do you how do you get to sleep? You, you wouldn't sleep that well, night. Well, maybe not. Yeah, probably don't. I sort of you don't yeah. sleep, and then you've only got you've only got twenty twenty five k to go. Last I think. Day. Yeah, something last like day. that. Yeah, now you've yeah. got this. Yeah. Even if you yeah. got injured, I'm pretty sure <laughs> you could wrap something around your ankle. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You know you're going to make it. Yeah. You're going to make it. Yeah. And it's just, it's really just a, um, you've got people lined the streets the whole way and you go right back into um, Queen Street Mall. Yeah. Any memories of that day, mate? It must have been, it must have been the best oh, day of your life. Oh, it's just, un- un- well, y- yeah, well, well, it's so unexpected, you know, you you, you you don't set off from home thinking, well, when I get back, boy, it's going to be terrific or anything because you just don't think it is. You just don't think it is at all. And, yeah, the, just the people, the crowd, the um, running across the bridge, running across the Brisbane River and then down and then you thought, well, that's enough people and you get to the mall and the whole mall, as far as you can look, see, it's just packed. I think there's – there would have been um – Thousands. Along the whole way, there would have been um, oh. possibly along the whole way, possibly tens of thousands. Right? Possibly, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was it was big. All because John Hamilton came and wrote an article in the Courier Mail, and then all the TV and everybody picked it up, and and they run with it for a night or two before I arrived, mm. and made it made it yeah really yeah it was, it was marvelous i think mate if you were from uh if you were from a fairly wealthy family you know going to some elite private school silver spoon in the mouth and and if you went on embarked on this i don't think um i don't think you would have got the same warmth and affection the exactly fact that you're right. from kabulcha working class suburb exactly you're an aussie battler you yeah. combine that with you taking out a mortgage. Yeah, um, this is costing you a fortune. Yeah. No one's, this is it. no one's actually um, help. No corporate Australia is not helping you out. People in Australia they love the underdog mm. story. Yeah, they love it. Oh yeah, this is what happened. John Hamilton, the reporter, and the story he did and what he picked up on mm. was exactly right. Very astute fellow. Obviously, he picked up on what would be an interesting article for the people. Yep. Not just running, 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 boring running and a few blisters or whatever or saw hip. Mm. He picked up on something that would really... Uh, so so yeah. the line was it's um, a run for the people or the people's run, was it? A run? It, it was... 
Well, they, they called you King of the Road, King of the Road, but they yes. also said, yeah, it was the people's run. So it seems like everyday Australians that were, were living through you, living well, vicariously Well, they could relate. You. I guess perhaps they could relate mm. because they all had their money problems too. Most 90-odd percent of us mm. all were ordinary people. We're ordinary people. They're only early, ordinary living and, and, mm. and bills have got to be paid and I guess they could relate to that part of it. Mm. They couldn't relate to running th- 217 continuous mm. days so much. Mm. But, yeah, I guess that's exactly what happened. And these people, they, they couldn't do this themselves, but if they could help you out in some small way, so it could be giving you some food, giving you some money, mm. um, not accepting payment for accommodation. Mm. It's like they've done their little bit and they're, um, they're living through you vicariously, you know, they're, and guess. they're kind of – I think it's – and I, obviously it would have been nice to get the major sponsorship, but in terms of a story, if you're making a movie about it, it almost – it's just so fitting that um, it's the people that really lifted you well, up. Well, yes. You, you, well, you summed it up nicely there. I guess I, I didn't so much think about that myself at that point, but I, uh, pretty much that's right, yes. Mm. Yes, you know, they could relate. They suddenly saw something more than just – yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you cross the line. What, what's it like actually finishing, actually oh. crossing the line? Oh, gee, you know, suddenly you <laughs> don't have to. If I never run another step in my life after that, mind you, I did do a lot of stuff after that, but had I not run another step after that, it, it would not have mattered too much. And Yeah, it was a marvellous, marvellous feeling and just the crowd and all, all of a sudden all the aches and pains and you just don't feel them. Mm. You just don't feel them, yeah. Yes. Yeah, mate. Just I'm amazing. just I'm just going through your book right now, and there's a nice little chapter in in retrospect. Before I get to that, what I found interesting, mate, is you didn't um, that that night. It's not like you went out to the local bars and clubs and had a big drinking session. <laughs> you just wanted to really just go to a quiet place and just reflect. Yes. And you, you you'd done it. You'd um, done the big speeches and. It must have been yeah, um, it must have been a shock to the system to see all those people. But then, um, what I found quite fitting, mate, is you just wanted to retreat, mm. go back to a quiet place, and just reflect. Well, you haven't. We haven't just played a football game or a tennis match. You know, I've been out there for a long, long time, and um, of course, I was extremely weary, and I just wanted to be with my family, my kids, my mother, and everybody, and, and the crew, and all of. All of us just together and the media just couldn't, they found it hard to handle. They wanted to see us drinking and eating and partying and woofing and yelling and shouting mm. and last thing you want to do. <laughs> so at that, at that time, you're, you're the man of the moment and everyone wants a piece of you. You're the man of the moment. So that must have been quite hard to deal with. <laughs> everyone just, it's, mm. it's hard to oh, take in, it right? It's very hard, yeah. You don't know what quite what you're supposed to do, really. I mean, you're not trained for this. This is not something you went to school and learned. Mm. Um, suddenly, you're having a book written about you. Um, everyone wants to know you. Everybody suddenly wants you to speak at their school or their charity or their function. Um, businesses are suddenly wanting you to do an ad for their car or their eggs or their something, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, very, very hard to know how to handle it, what to do, um, yeah. You must have been thinking in your head, uh, you know, you're all alone on the Barclay, mm. all alone out there by yourself, and then everyone wants a piece of you um, mm. Mm. in Brisbane. You must have been thinking, God, this is such a strange feeling, mm. right? Yeah. Because most of the run, you, you're basically um, on your own, battling against yourself, and then, um, yeah, well, you're a celebrity. You're a celebrity. Um, so I'll just go through the book here. Um it was a bit embarrassing in a way. I had a great sense of relief that it was over and I, and I had made it. I didn't have any great feeling that I wanted to shout, yell or jump up and down. I didn't want to do that. I remember the media came up to my unit that night and were surprised that there was just my family, just me and my family. They couldn't understand why I wasn't having a big party. It was a feeling of quiet. I was happy. It had been a great day all around. I was embarrassed because runners don't expect that. I was relieved that we had all arrived safely. I owed so I owed so many people so much. 
everybody had turned out to see me and the crew. So, um, yeah, I, th- I thought that was pretty interesting, mate. Mm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a different side to what you expect. I mean, somebody wanted to break open champagne at the finish in the mall and squirt us when I refused. I said, you do, you know, mm. I just refused the whole thing. I, mm. I can't stand that. Uh, uh, we're a different breed. We're not like most ultra runners are not like most sports people. Yeah, I think that's why people warm to you so much, Ron, is because you're, you're very humble. You're not big noting yourself. You're not walking around with a big ego and um, look at me, look at me. It's like you'd, you'd done the run and then you just retreat back to your quiet life. Well, you know where you stand. I mean, one of my crew members could run faster than me. He was faster over the marathon, the 42K marathon. He could run faster than me over anything. It's just that I did... My only claim to fame was I went further than the rest of them. Mm. Mm. So I, I knew where I stood as a runner. I wasn't the fastest or the best or anything. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. did more. What did you do over the next few days, few weeks, few months after your, after your big run? Did you actually take a break? Uh, at what point did you get back to your business? You pretty think? pretty much straight away, you see. Um, a lot of people, when they do big things like that, I, I, I've talked to few ultra runners after they've done big things that they've aimed for for a long time and they talk about being down and out and can't get back into everything but I had to I had no choice and it wasn't as if I just had a job I had my own business and I had to get back to it or else I'd lose it and and the house and everything so I had no choice um and and I I got back to work pretty well, straight away, um, I, I may have, may have probably had one of my helpers helping me for a while till I got mm-hmm. back into the swing of it. Um, and I don't recall taking much time out of training or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, out of running, I, I wouldn't have called it training, but I'm pretty sure I would have gone out mm-hmm. p- pretty much all ev- every day, sure. at least for a walk. Well, for instance, um, a day or two after. I, I had to run into Caboolture. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my hometown. And yeah. the whole of Caboolture was closed down and thousands packed Caboolture mm. for, for that. So, uh, and, and they wanted me to run in for a little way out because everyone was there. Mm. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and that was really something. I mean, to see the whole middle of the town. Mm. And then... The um, local car dealer at Caboolture took our vehicles and, and did them complete overall, repainted, redid the yeah. family vehicles and, and all that as well. So it was really, really, that Caboolture was marvellous. Was there a thought, mate, when you finished your big run that you're going to hang up your, your running boots? Was there ever a thought that, you know, God, I've, I've done this now? Or did, did you still think I've... You th- were, you st- were you thinking about future projects? No, no, and no, I never did. Um, if, I, I, I didn't run with many big aims ahead much at all. They'd come. They'd just come. Call it God telling me, call it whatever you want. Uh, I, they would just come to me. And um, I, I was – some years back I'd run across the Simpson Desert in, in the wintertime and I was sitting in the Birdsville Hotel with a – a couple of old drovers either side of me, an old, beaten up like I look now, you know, old blokes. <laughs> and, and I remember chatting always to them, and they said to me, nobody's ever footed across the Simpson Desert in summer. I never thought much about that, but I remembered. After around Australia, just carried on, no doubt jogging, probably quite fast got back to running with my mates because I loved going out with my mates over short runs of 5, 10, 20k, 20 miles, whatever we did on Mount Me and all that. It was fun, a bunch of us. We had a lot of runners in Caboolture in those days, a lot of blokes run. We had quite a lot of sub three-hour marathon runners. It was fun running with them, thoroughly enjoyed it. So I probably got back to doing that. And then gradually, as time went by, um, in, that was 83. In 84, I didn't do any big things but suddenly the, the, the thought of the Simpson Desert came along, you know. I thought, these blokes said no one's done it in summer. Mm. 
and they talk about Death Valley. So, gotcha. so you know, nothing. I never planned ahead much, but thoughts would just come, yeah, and then sure. va- gradually that become a back sure. in in eighty five that become a reality. But but they just appeared. Mm. Uh, so, mate, how, how wrecked was your body after the the run? Um, uh, well, no, not bad at all, uh, surprisingly, because um, uh, while I'm not into a whole lot of testing and stuff, but, but the university at, at St. Lucia wanted to do tests before I left. Lee Tickle was doing some tests for the university because he was a university man uh, as I run around Australia to see how I was going. I do remember, for instance, when he used to test my pulse quite often, even in the heat of the north, my running pulse uh, during the day would be something like about 90, which oh, is man. not bad. It's pretty low, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, considering. And then my resting pulse was somewhere in the 30s. And he would do these tests. And um, they, they tested me at the university before I left, and I was quite fit, obviously. And they tested me when I finished you know, all those tests, things in your mouth, yeah. running on the treadmill, yeah. dipping you in water and all this stuff. And and I don't remember the details, but they just said, you're fitter than when you left. And I said, really? You better check my mind. I'm not really. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So your cardio, your cardiovascular would be a lot well, better. At one stage running around – one of the tests up in Townsville or Darwin or somewhere, they came back with the thought that, and it made the front page of the Courier Mail again, that I they, that, that I was below the chart on the, what was it, the cholesterol test or something? Mm. Something or other, that they have a chart for it. Well, mine was so low that they, the chart didn't go low enough to record. I'd wow. had such a <laughs> system. I wouldn't think it's that now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's incredible, mate. But you must have taken some time for that um, that stress fr- fracture to heal. Oh well, did you just have a few days off of just walking? Probably did. I I don't exactly remember what I did uh, after, but I, I must have. I must have because I would yeah. have had to get that healed. But for the tests that they had me running sure. on this treadmill, it was probably rubberized, and it yep. probably didn't bother my mm. foot too much. Mm. Um, but yeah, I would think that's what I did. I'm sure that's what I did. What's it like getting back to your normal bread run where now you're an actual, you're, you're a public figure? So when you're going out and doing your regular run, I imagine people are coming up to you mm, and saying mm, hi and mm. wanting a photo, an autograph. I'd imagine that would become annoying because you, you just want to go back to your normal life. Well, yes and no. Um, at the time, you see, when you don't have much of that, it's, it's kind of fun for a while and you think, oh, this is pretty good, you know, and, and you sort of go along with it all. And I was getting a lot of invites to go and do things. And I, I did a lot of school things, talking to school kids and stuff. And, and that was that was good. They were good. The primary school ones, I, I got to dislike the high school ones a bit because there's always a smart aleck there. But <laughs> and mm-hmm. the, the younger ones were, were really good. And I did a few charity things. And, and so it, it was all right. And... and um, it was later on after I did a whole lot more things. See, that was I was forty. Well, I I did a lot of stuff up until I was nearly fifty, mm. and so by then I was starting to wear thin of it. I remember doing a job with Tracy Wickham out Dolby, I think it was, and and I remember her saying by then she'd had a quite a long career of it, and she said, "I'm looking forward to the day nobody knows me." <laughs> mm. Well, well, I hadn't had too much of it at that point. And so it wasn't a problem, but I always remember what she said, and I got to that stage much later on sure. where you and, and in fact that's when I came up to your town here at Nanango, Nanango. for a time to yeah. escape, and I yeah. spent some time up here to escape, yep. uh, and 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 I went to the uh, give a talk at the youth club here in town, and there's all these young people. Uh, Ian Jones had all these young people at his youth club, and he said, "You know who this is?" And some kid up the back says, "Yeah, the milkman." I thought I've, I've made it. I've um, I've escaped. That's great. <laughs> it was yeah. beautiful. It was great. Yeah. Well, mate. Before I before we finish up, um, I don't want to hold you up, and I, I'd love to get you back at another point to talk about, particularly your your big uh, a thousand hours um, in mm, the park. Where you two did, of them. Yeah. This is incredible because it actually relates to. Um, what to, you're doing to yeah. what we're doing it's a shorter distance but it, it relates because mm. um it's over a thousand hours um mm. 
And 42 days. 42 days, yeah. Mm. So I'd love to get you back to speak about that. Um, mate, firstly, do you think someone could run around Australia today and, and do something similar to yourself? Or do you think it's um, – obviously, 1983, Australia would have been – a different place to what it oh, is yes. now. Oh, yes, and you could run Highway 1 and, and, and it, it was a very different place and it hadn't been done. Um, it's been done since. Um, and, and I got a phone call one day from Pat Farmer and, and, and he's done a lot of great runs and, and he's, he's a good run. And he said, Ron, I want to break your record. Will you help me? <laughs> yeah, okay, Pat. And he went out and did it, but it took 17 years for someone to break that record mm-hmm. and Pat Farmer did. And then it took another 18 years for... Dave Alley, policeman in Brisbane, to break Pat Farmers. Mm. So they have done it, but they yeah. knew it could be done. The, sure. the big difference is it's like uh, Hillary up Mount Everest. But after that, I thought, well, Hillary did it, so mm. so can we. <laughs> um, so, yes, they can do it, but but also they have a big problem now which where, where the police are very strict and, and it's almost impossible to run a lot of Highway 1. So it, it, it is really difficult and just really, nobody knows they did it. It's it's almost like, hey, gee, who cares? Which is a sad thing. You but know. just the permitting, the permit. The camp, oh, yes. You, you'd probably need a permit for each council. Oh, everything. You know, everywhere it, it would you be go. a nightmare. Yeah, it was it was easy those days. You could yeah. do anything. You know, mm. same with organising running events on the road in in Caboolture in the early days. I could organise a fun run in the middle of Caboolture. Just go up to the police station and say, I want to put the fun. Oh, yeah, good on you, Ron. Uh, if I get up in time, I'll come and have a look. <laughs> mm. I mean, now you've got, to go, you've got to jump through all sorts of hoops. So everything's hardest, whether you want to run around Australia or organise a little fun run. Yeah. So it took you 217 days. Um, the people who, who then went on to break your record, um, did, did they have, your, have the same uh, public speaking engagements and this and that and all the different – things you had to do along the way or were they a bit more business-like in terms uh, of – They didn't have so much time because they're out to beat a time and, yep. and so they had to sort of work a bit harder than, yep. in that respect. But they didn't have the mental uh, stress because they got sponsored mm-hmm. easier um, either because they were involved with someone or well, well, Pat Farmer was involved with the Australian government's centenary celebrations the year he did it. And uh, Dave Alley was the police, I think. Dave was, Dave was I still in touch with them both. Uh, mm-hmm. I helped them both. Used to go out to the different states and mm-hmm. encourage them. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have. I should have discouraged them. I did, in fact, discourage them. They both said to me, uh, they'd come and visit, and they'd say, Ron, any, what's the last minute advice before I start? And I'd say, don't do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But they did. They went and did it. Um, so, yeah, look – Different, different thing today. If you've got to run faster, that's a big strain in itself. Yeah. Can you run faster? Mm. And they did, and they did, but they didn't have the financial burden. Sure. Um, and so, therefore, because they had to run faster, they would have had less commitments. Sure. Dave Alley is a most interesting case, really interesting case. Five years prior to running around, he cycled around. He cycled Man. around in 37 days at 500k a day. Incredible. Incredible. Absolutely. To break. And also the, the, the cycling record was already very good because quite a few people cycled it over the years, but it got faster and faster. And Dave Alley did that, and to my knowledge, it hasn't been broken. Wow. And then five years later, he decides he wasn't really a runner as such, a very fit bloke, obviously. He decided to run around, and he rung me up and said, will you help me? And God. he used to come to my house all the time. He still rings me up. We still talk. Wow. Some years later, and, and he ran around and, and broke Pat Farmer's record. So he holds yeah. both the cycling and the running record for around Australia. That's incredible. Dave Alley, yeah, marvellous. And that Absolute. was relatively recently, right? Yes, it was. Only Dave, well, um, I'm thinking only five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and do you know how many days he did it in? No, I don't. Uh, and probably the reason I didn't take a lot of notice and times and days and stuff is that their course was not the same as mine. Oh, cool. Exactly. It couldn't yeah, be. Sure. They still went around Australia, but they had to go in and out here yep. and there. Yep. And, um, yeah, yeah, different, different. But, mm. but um, I think they ended up having to do much, very similar number of days uh, because they had to do more mm. to dodge 
the busy traffic. Yeah. You know? So do you think if, if someone, yeah, if you've got no financial burden, if you've got this hot shot professional crew, <laughs> you do your so many Ks for the day and you go to a nice air-conditioned hotel. Oh, you well, they had air-conditioned caravans too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, ours wasn't. Yeah, and you just watch the TV and you have no public speaking. Um, you just, you're basically there to do a job, break the record, get it done. Um, still be hard. Still be obviously. Still I would. Be hard. I wouldn't like to do it. Yeah, <laughs> mate. Um, when I'm when I'm reading when I'm reading this book, it's it's a sense of sadness because Australia was definitely a different. It was a different time and place in 1983. The sadness for me comes, mate, when I just think today, if someone did it today, I just don't think you'd have school children lining the streets. No. Um, one because schools are very different places because. You know, you'd have to do a risk assessment. <laughs> you couldn't have the kids kids running along the highway for a few k's and and just coming coming back. And I just, I think you could send an email out to schools. I don't think the email would get to the right people. Um, You're right. They'd take a look at it and they'd think, well, you know, this is too hard. One, yep. would the kids be interested? They're so they're more interested in looking at their phones. Yep than about someone running around Australia. And two, exactly. the paperwork that would be needed, you'd have to um, do a risk assessment. You have to send a letter home to parents. Sure. Um, there's no way you can have kids running along the highway. No, no. I think there's a real sense of sadness, mate, that yes. I, I don't yes. think your run could be replicated today and have that same no. feel-good no. No, it couldn't. energy. It, it couldn't. Just look at Camel Wheel. What were we, a few K from the border, the Northern Territory border? And, and and almost thought the whole school, well, the whole school run down the road with me and some of them dropped off gradually, but most of them kept going to the border. Mm. And I had to say to them, you don't think your mum and dad will be worried about you? Oh, no, mm. mister, it's all right. They're used to us going running and doing this and that. Mm. Marvellous. Absolutely yeah. incredible. And in many cases that happened, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the teachers would have been teaching yeah. the kids, oh, yeah. oh, you know, Ron's only half an hour away, we've got word mm. on the radio, mm. and they'd stop class. Just and like that. All the school would come out, they'd oh. line the streets. Marvellous. And, and that they would yeah. have learnt something, Ron, like they would have given you some letters and there would have been an exchange between the two. Yeah. But you know what, if it happened today, I, I know I'm no. sounding cynical. Yeah, I know, but so it's, Ron, it's sad, and that the system is, the system's gone overboard. Yeah, but how much value could the kids get just to have that experience? And yeah. they'd say, well, Ron, you know, we'd love to have you, but um, it, it, we actually we can't, interrupt the, we can't interrupt the maths yep. class. That's right. Um, That's because right. we would be behind in this and this mm -hmm. and this and we'd get in yeah. trouble. And yes. yeah. to me it was a sense of sadness. It is, yeah. Yeah, I agree, totally agree. Yeah, mm. no, it was great. I was timing. I was very fortunate to be in that spot in those years and, mm. um, you know, s saw the – challenge of first many other things i did first as well you mm. know and just um yeah you know i mean in in 84 the the year after lady salento was named queensland of the year they named me queensland of the year and i thought really all i did was run around the country this lady did a whole lot of she's a doctor dr lady salento marvelous stuff you know and for years and years and years and years and and, and you get that and you think wow this is it wouldn't happen today. It just wouldn't happen. Mm. Yeah. And one last thing, Ron. It seemed that you fell in love with small towns. Yes. You know, at, um, you love the bush. You love the outback. You love the people of small towns. And um, you're living in a small town now. So mm. it, it seems like mm. you had a strong affinity for... Oh, I just love the, the old ways. I mm. I just like the small... Yeah, you're right, small towns. Um, Caboolture was a small town. Mm. And my kids had a great time there growing up. It was wonderful for them. I, I, I ducked up here to Nanango for five years to relax and unwind, um, escape everything. It, it was it was really nice. And, and now we've moved from Caboolture, Caloundra area, where we had places to, uh, to Gulawa, and that's even smaller. Great. And it reminds me so much of growing up. The the attitude. I mean, uh, horses go down the main street still. So you love the slower pace. Yes, relaxed oh, lifestyle. That's great. Yeah. Traffic's horrible. Yeah. Uh, no traffic. Sitting in traffic every no day. No traffic. Right? <laughs> oh, oh. 
Anyway, mate, I won't hold you up. Thanks so much for coming, and um, I'd love to get you back at a later point to talk about your other adventures. But um, yeah, really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Timothy. Thanks, mate.